It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Renee's here, Andy's here, and a visit from the original Mac Break Weekly panelist, David Pogue of CBS Sunday Morning. We'll talk about CBS's big scoop. Something's going to happen tomorrow. What will it be? David has a theory. We'll also talk about the big success for Apple Macintoshes in the last quarter and what we might see in the quarterly financials coming up in a couple of weeks and a new way to use your Apple Watch. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 748, recorded Tuesday, January 12th, 2021. Siri, drive me home. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Stop handing over your personal data to ISPs who mine your activity and sell off your information. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash MacBreak. And by the TriCaster 2 Elite from NewTek, the most complete live production system on the planet. There's a TriCaster for every production, including yours, including ours. Go to newtech.com slash TriCaster, where an interactive guide will advise you on which TriCaster is right for you. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Apple. We have assembled a lovely team of experts to talk about absolutely nothing. <laughs> Starting with, I hear his chortle already, Andy Anako from WGBH Boston. Hello, Andrew. That's exactly the sort of introduction I like. I can live up to those expectations. We're <laughs> off on a great foot. We've got nothing to say, and we've got lots of things to say about it or something. Uh, I like the color. Co You're not normally the most colorful person, but you, you've got this beautiful, colorful baseball shirt and i just like that yeah this was this this is this is my idea of colorful and that oh look it's actually like desaturated colors i can deal with that yeah so. yeah <laughs> it's pretty I, it's, I bought it for an addition a community audition of pippin uh eight years ago <laughs> and found out that it works for my daily wear as well we got somebody who could sing pippin joining us in a second but first <laughs> renee ritchie <laughs> from youtube.com slash renee ritchie hello renee wearing giants oh, black yeah, and orange say thank you I, I was going to say I could sing Pippin, but none of us would be happy about it. Not any Join of us. us. <laughs> you know who can sing and play Pippin? Really pleased to have him on the show this week. Our old friend, he's been on Mac Break with you many times, but not, not in quite a while. David Pogue is joining us. Hey, David. Everything has its season. Everything has its time. People are like, what podcast did I just tune into? <laughs> I bet you were in Pippin at some point. I conducted Pippin, in fact, in See? college. See? Uh, many people probably don't know. They know David from, uh, of course, uh, CBS this, uh, uh, this morning. It's Sunday morning, right? Correct. CBS Sunday morning. But, uh, and, and before that, the Scientific American show. And before, I mean, David goes way back. New York Times, the missing manuals. Little iPhone review. Uh, like yeah. Yep. That iPhone review that lives forever. Uh, but <laughs> David is also a Broadway composer. And do you ever do the parody songs you used to do so at, at Macworld Expo? Do you do those anymore? I do all the time. Whenever, well, I, there hasn't been much on the speaking circuit lately, as you all know. Yes. But uh, when I do talks, I I always arrange to have a keyboard, and at the end, nice. I'll do some of my song parodies. And I've I've kept doing new ones. There's a new Twitter one. There's a new Facebook one. And so on. He's the. Uh, I was almost said you're the. Uh, the geeky, geeky Weird Al Yankovic, except he's the geeky Weird Al Yankovic, so <laughs> you're, the, you're the even geekier Weird, weird Al Yankovic. You were on the hey, very Leo. first Mac Break Weekly, so it, you deserve to be here today. That's a good place to Well, start. Especially because I have a book to plug. Is now my opportunity? Now would be a great time. <laughs> we should mention Dave is not doing the missing manuals anymore. No, I'm not. O'Reilly has said... Not people don't buy computer books. Oh, sorry about the focus there. I'm oh my god! Oh my, there we go. You got the you got the anti jazz fans jazz hands filter. <laughs> the anti the counter. Do not filter. wave your hands, David. Keep your hands below the camera. Okay. I'll just remain frozen. Just <laughs> yes, like this. don't move. It's in focus. <laughs> I um so yeah so uh, we're not I'm not doing any more missing manuals. Instead, Simon and Schuster has snapped up the idea of my writing computer books. Happy to announce. Mac Unlocked, now shipping. It's exactly the same thing as the missing manual, but now called Miss Mac Unlocked. 
And coming out in two weeks is iPhone Unlocked, and the uh, the ebook is already available. Oh, nice. uh, already available. This one's in full color. The uh, Mac Unlocked is in black and white, and uh, they're both gorgeous and brilliant and funny, if I may say so. And, and much better in focus than this camera. And in two weeks, it's <laughs> the end of the world as we know it. And I have pre-ordered your newest book, How to Prepare for Climate. Yes, How to Prepare oh, for Climate Change. So kind. A practical guide. <laughs> there it is to surviving the chaos. And when you were on Twitter a few weeks ago, I mentioned that I had already, I had had this thought about six months ago. You know, things are going to change. I should probably think about what that means. And I went out and I bought a couple of books, uh, The Uninhabitable Earth. I, that was so depressing. I had to stop, <laughs> stop reading that. <laughs> and uh, the, what was it? The sixth, seventh, eighth extinction? I can't remember. Apparently, uh, we've had extinction events before. Uh, but they were kind of, that bummed me out, but I think yours will, knowing you, yours will be an optimistic look at the end of the world. Yeah, exactly. My, my editor calls it the first uplifting book about climate change. <laughs> oh, it's boy. about action you can take. Yeah. It's about taking yeah. control over your situation. Yeah. It's exactly what I was looking for. So I'm really pleased. Uh, it says I purchased it on December 13th, as you can see, which is, and when, I thank you for your support when you were on Twitter and everybody can pre-order. It comes out January 26th. So uh, thank you for being here. It's really nice to see you, David. We really appreciate it. There, as I and, said, and by the way, yeah. one more thing, not about me and my self-interest. Um, I would just like to say that it's great to see Andy and Notco again. We used to do stuff all the time back in the Mac World days. And my favorite conversation was the one where I asked him if he ever has trouble getting people to spell his last name. And I don't know if you still say this, Andy, but what you told me then was it's very easy. When you ask, how do you spell Inotco, you say the first three letters stand for I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 great, it's great talking to you too because I I I'll, uh, I had to share this story with him. Uh, when my my dad used to pick me up from the airport like when I'd go travel and like to and drive me home because he he was very much a dad. Said no 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 you're not you know don't no, don't pay for parking don't pay for parking I'll, I'll drive you home I'll drive I'll pick you up and it was great because like I'd be I'd be away from the family for a couple of weeks so I, I get I, I get caught up and I say so dad what's uh, what's what's new what you been doing so oh yeah I got I bought a new digital camera. And I, I, I'm thinking, oh, well, gee, he didn't discuss that with me. That's interesting. I said, oh, that's real. How, uh, which one did you pick? Oh, I picked this Panasonic. I, uh, it was recommended by David Pogue. You know, he really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> so, I had, so, I had, so I emailed David and say, okay, fine. Here, I hope you enjoy your new dad. Here's his phone number. <laughs> he, 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 he works too hard when he tries to shovel, so try to get there early if you know it's going to oh, pull. <laughs> that's so harsh. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so there, the uh, all of the Apple news will happen tomorrow. There's a lot of rumor news, a huge drumbeat of rumor news. Uh, but the biggest story, I think, um, Tim Cook was was on a CBS this morning, your 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 show, uh, talking uh, about a variety of things. Gail King um, said, uh, you know, they were talking about the chaos and so forth. Um, King said Cook was going to was on CBS about a different topic a big announcement coming Wednesday tomorrow King stressed it was not a new product but their view was something bigger and better than that well, now, it narrows it down a lot at least <laughs> well we know it's not a well, new there's Mac there's only two things that Apple thinks is bigger than a product and that's health or privacy or <laughs> augmented reality glasses or the other big product. rumor, which is a car. Uh, That's a product. Huh? Oh, it's a product. Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. not. Yeah. Maybe not a viable product, but still technically it displaces <laughs> air. So not. Well, but okay. So maybe I'm over parsing it. Not a new product might mean we're not announcing a new product tomorrow, but we might be talking about a new initiative. The, the initiatives yeah. Apple has been taking lately have indeed been around privacy and health Um Remember, they launched the, the COVID tracing technology that 20 states have now adapted. They worked with Google on that. Um, so I, w one of the theories is that it's a uh, they're going to dedicate their Apple stores to be vaccination centers. Oh, that would be cool. Yeah. Free? Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the vaccine is free to everybody, of course, and that they would offer a, a place to do it that would be organized and central and predictable. 
Interesting. Logistics, which I think has been a big issue because there's a lot of vaccine that's just not getting to people. Uh, lack of organization. There's lack of a national, in many countries, lack of a national initiative. They can't get it off the shelves. Uh, they, they're not properly following the dosage. And if there's nothing else that Tim Cook's Apple excels at better, it's it's logistics. It's getting yeah. product delivered to people. So Exactly right. So that story, I think, originated with Neil Seibart. He, he suggested yeah. that even though she could have done the interview from every, anywhere, she did the interview with Tim Cook, who was remote at an Apple store. She was at an Apple store, right? Or was he at an Apple yes, store? Yes, that's right. She that's was at an Apple store. Yeah. Um, I got the. I gather that the implication is that he, that Cook's going to either gave her that announcement and they'll air it tomorrow on on CBS this morning, or that he's going to do it in the morning. Um, he's, it, it sounded like it was a pre-recorded interview yeah. and that this was part of that interview. Yeah. So whatever it is, it's already in the can. Boy, it's, I it's, tell you, I wish we had something like that. Tomorrow, we'll, <laughs> <laughs> something big is going to happen. Um, Those tomorrow, stories, Andy Nocco, the, David Pogue, duet, Broadway. <laughs> can I, can, well, can, can I say that also, like, he, he's, he's worked with Nova uh, on WGBH. I do tech on WGBH every Friday. So it's, it's public broadcasting mm. versus whatever your whatever self-interest you two are into that's all <laughs> so so it, it, what is it is it you feel like that's pretty sure what that is is vaccine no i think I, it's just it's, it's, it's an just interesting theory yeah yeah but it's going the, the, to be the, some the, kind of non-technological -techno outreach thing like apple has been doing more and more lately you know the the research kit stuff and the the um covid tracking i think it's going to be something socially oriented yeah yeah that's 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 for sure also remember that this this is technically ces week and so if they were planning this way way in advance they could have said what do we want to if we want to have some sort of a presence in the media conversation during ces week and we're certainly not going to be using this time to announce a product do we want to clarify do we want to make another push for our privacy initiatives do we want to make another push for our health initiatives so it could be something broad as opposed to something specific but it really, it, who knows at this point? Can't wait. We were going to put another billboard up in Las Vegas to talk about privacy. It better not that be went that. So, well last time. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have to refactor it and we're going to do a big privacy announcement. Instead. It's, it's, I mean, it would be great if they could somehow solve the, the waste problem. I was, I was reading in the Times about how the Moderna vaccine comes 12 doses per vial. Yeah. I'm sorry, 10 doses per vial. Yeah. And so if they have, you know, first responder health people and then a couple of over 75 year olds, and then there's four doses left from that vial, they throw it away. It makes Which me is crazy. crazy. Yeah. Um, that would be really interesting. Apple stores are not everywhere, but there are a lot of them. Um, also, also real, the, the, the thing that would be a little bit of a, I don't, I don't want to say concern, but something that would be notable is that they don't exactly build Apple stores in low income communities. Exactly. So or rural areas. Yeah. So um, there are 506 Apple stores worldwide. I don't know how many they are in the uh, in the U.S. So. Um, yeah, it they would also be. Also, said his lack of people, right? Like they just don't have enough people to to give the vaccine, and they're going to start drafting dentists and yeah. all sorts of other people. Yeah. And if you can contribute from uh, a massive pool of people who can be trained, because they're trained to do technical stuff all the time, there's just lots of ways a, a it could lot be of helpful. Apple but. stores are in malls. I mean, the, the Apple stores that are, you know, standalone, like the Fifth Avenue store, that seems doable. But if you're in a mall, what are you going to queue up inside a mall to get a vaccine? Doesn't seem like, like an it. iPhone launch. Yeah. yeah, very similar. Yeah. yeah. The other failure of this theory, I have to say, is that Walgreens and Rite Aid yeah. and CVS are also designated to do Yeah, that makes that. more sense, right? Yes. And there's many more of those. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I got my good flu on shot Apple. at the pharmacy this year. It was so easy, so quick, so well right. done. I don't think I'm ever going anywhere but right. pharmacy again. Good on Apple. But they, you know, remember they started making uh, face shields uh, early yeah. on. Uh, when the PPE shortage was happening back in the summer, so uh, you know they're obviously on top of it. Tim Cook is uh, is very civic minded, unlike Steve Maybe. Jobs. They make mask. They make their own masks now too. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Maybe, maybe they're going to go for the big swing and say, you know what, we, we're fed up with with uh, with the anti-democratic processes in China. We're completely pulling out of the market because we just don't want that hanging over our heads anymore. Yeah. Or maybe if they got their own vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> the <laughs> Apple vaccine to go with the Apple car. Everything should be Come, Apple. Comes in a one. white okay. syringe. Yeah, perfect. Okay, okay. <laughs> and you'd love you'd have, the box. You'd, you'd, <laughs> You'd have the you'd have the vaccine that's free, but then you'd have the, the aspirational vaccine <laughs> that actually costs five hundred dollars more. Vaccine max. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, as you mentioned, David Pogue's review of the iPhone was seminal. It is now the thirteenth anniversary, January 9th, So three days ago was the thirteenth anniversary, not of the ship date, but of the announcement. That famous Steve Jobs speech. Were you all there it at? Uh, Moscone Center when Steve announced the iPhone. Yeah, I was, I was there. Yeah, I was there. I, you got it backwards, Leo. One. It's the 13th anniversary of the shipping, not the announcement. The announcement was in June. And the oh, shipping really? Was the shipping yeah. was in January. Are you sure? All the way around. No, no. He announced it at WWDC nope. in January, and it came out I, six no, months later. No, he announced it at Macworld at, uh, in January. Yeah. Or Macworld, rather, not WWDC. Yeah, Macworld. Right, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. They shipped yeah. it after Dub Dub. I, I was sitting next to Scott Bourne, who was... The, he was the guy who wanted an iPhone vest. He was so sure <laughs> that there... No, we didn't know for sure there was going to be an iPhone. This is back when Apple really could lock this stuff down. So we had no idea. David, did you know you probably had an advanced preview? No, no. Uh, I did not have an... I will share with you uh, a story I've, I've never told anyone that's really embarrassing and makes me look terrible, though, about that. Um, <laughs> Apple gave four people the phone before two weeks before it was available to the public. So that was Wall Street Journal, Walt Mossberg, New York Times, me and Stephen Levy at Newsweek. Ed Baig from USA Ed, Today. Got Ed Baig from USA Today. Yep. Yep. So we I remember this because I'm bitter to this day, 13 years later. No, no, I know you are. <laughs> no, so <not>. bitter, so <laughs> salty. And so it was so cool and I wasn't allowed to show anybody, but I could play with it. I could learn it. And one of the first things I had since being issued the phone was a, a speaking engagement in Lake Como, Italy. Oh. So I took a red eye with this thing in my pocket, oh, nice. landed, got in a cab to the venue of the talk, slumped down in the cab seat, fell asleep. Oh, no. Oh, the no. The phone slipped out of oh, my no. pocket oh, in no. the taxi. One of four existed did you, in the did world. You, were you able to recover it? I, I got out, uh, I got my tour of the venue, I met the organizers, and then realized it. Oh, and just God. about, you know, my heart dropped out of my body. And <laughs> she said in Italian, well, of course, she's probably, you probably got the receipt, right? And I the did. Receipt. The receipt? Phone There's number was receipt? on it. Oh, right. <laughs> we got it back. I mean, he, he was really mad when he came back to the place. I, I emptied my wallet to him, like, please take this tip. And uh, But he was really infuriated. He had no idea what it was. He thought it was some pager or something. So, so he's like, I can't, I can't do a bad so Italian close. accent. No. Uh, any, an infuriated Italian, we can all see. We can all imagine that. <laughs> Especially an infuriated Italian cabbie. Uh, no, wow. No, wow. Yeah, and unfortunately, so Gizmodo the, didn't exist back then, so they couldn't sell it to anybody. So yeah, this is my, prior to the, you know many years prior to the iPhone four leak to Gizmodo. That's um, right, and that fortunately, all tragedy. the Apple PR people who would be furious at me to know this story have now moved on. Yeah, so yeah, you're safe. The story can now be told. <laughs> it can now <laughs> be told. Be <gasps> oh my God, my you, yeah. yeah, literally, you you that would be a horrible feeling. I thought my career is over. This is it. No one's ever going to entrust me with anything again. How well did that first iPhone work? I mean, it worked well, but you got to remember how incredibly limited it right. couldn't record video. There was no copy and paste. You couldn't send pictures by text. I mean, it was, and, and of course, there were only the 16 apps. There was only one home screen page. There was no app store. You were limited to what Apple gave you. So unbelievably limited compared to what we have today. And yet people lost their minds. Well, David, did you, go ahead. I just want to ask, did you, did you get to play with one like right after the keynote? Did you get a briefing? Yes. Did We, we each got a, a briefing. We each got 15 minutes with Steve Jobs. Oh, my. I, I, I got a brief. I did not get a brief. I got a briefing with Jaws, but not one, but not Steve. But yeah, that was if what do you what do you remember about like the January version of the of the device as it was working? You know, I was just really hung up on there being no keyboard. I was really like I couldn't get past the fact that we're going to type on glass for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I was kind of right. That kind of is the part that still sucks. 
This is your uh, your initial Ooh, review. You're good. There's is that Kelly? Did, is did Steve call uh, the taxi that, driver? Did the taxi he, driver tell you about Steve calling to ask how the phone was working? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's the matter? What's the, who is this? Steve getting so angry. I'm who is so it? impressed with David Pogue. He speaks fluent and very angry <laughs> Italian. <laughs> Look at the bezels on that. Is that that's one of your kids though, right? Yeah, that's right. I think that is Jeffrey. Yeah. Jeffrey. Who's now 16. Yeah, I know. He was the youngest of the Pogue wow. brood. <laughs> oh, isn't that great? Yeah, you, the Times sent a photographer cool. over to our house in Connecticut to take these pictures. Yeah, because you couldn't use your other iPhone to take that picture, <laughs> <laughs> as everybody has done since, cool. right? The old iPhone to take a picture of the new one. The iPhone, you said, matches most of its hype. Uh, I, I love David's leads. You're you're always the best. Talk about hype. In the last six months, Apple's iPhone has been the subject of 11,000 print articles. Turns up about 69 million hits on Google. Cultists are camping out in front of Apple stores. Bloggers call it the Jesus phone. All of this before a single consumer has even touched the thing. Um, you said it's revolutionary. It's flawed, which, which it was. But no you flash. recognized, unlike many, including Steve Ballmer and the uh, CEO of BlackBerry. Ed Colligan. And Ed Colligan. <laughs> you recognized that there was uh, this was an important new product and not just because it was from apple yeah i mean the central conceit of this thing being all screen i mean that was that was the revolutionary thing that was the forward-looking thing multi-touch was super cool over although you know how much do we use multi-touch apart from zooming in i don't know but but that anyway, was that cool was, i remember that was the first time we'd had a, a chance to use pinch and zoom and all of that stuff so that was Remember really when cool. Steve yeah. showed that on stage at yeah. that keynote? The yeah. audience went, he just went like, <gasps> <gasps> the audience <gasps> lost its mind. Uh, you it's said, the elastic. You said the phone is so sleek and thin, which of course it it is. Actually, I should go get my iPhone, my original iPhone I have in the other room. The phone is so yeah, sleek and thin, here. it makes trios and Blackberries look obese. There it is. Look at that. I don't know. Is it's it so really that video. much? Th is it really that much thicker than the iPhone 12? I wonder. Let's see. Okay. Maybe not. Yeah. It, it felt a little pudgy in hindsight. Yeah, it's a little thicker. Remember, there's that story that Steve Jobs insisted on the rounded edges yeah. and corners and yeah. the engineers pushed back. They're like, Steve, that's dead space. You're wasting space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah rectangular. But nature is round. But nature is round, let's, Steve. Let's said. let's also let's also uh, remember that because of that purely aesthetic decision, you couldn't just take a pair of headphones or an ear set and plug it in. You needed a dongle because it was because the uh, uh, the the jack for it was it was, it was so deep behind that curve. Yeah, yeah. So you needed a special so super skinny style of yeah. My understanding is that Johnny didn't want a headphone jack, but because they were the iPod company, that side eventually won the argument, and they had to retrofit the headphone jack into the design because they weren't going to change the outer casing design. And that's the best they could do for the first version. And that's why it got much better in the second yeah. version. <laughs> David wrote, I've walked around with an iPhone in my pocket for two weeks, naked and unprotected. The iPhone, that is, not me. Okay, no let us. You don't mention the uh, the moment in the Italian cab, which is yeah, no. <laughs> completely understandable now. Uh, it's hysterical. Um, yeah, I think... You know, remember Steve Ballmer, of the CEO of Microsoft, laughed at the cost of it, which then was half what it costs today, five hundred and six hundred dollars. Um, yeah. And yet he I said, like our nobody, chances. nobody, will, yeah, nobody will buy a five hundred dollars phone. It's gonna be phone. the most expensive phone in the market. Yeah. <laughs> I like our chances. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of people who did not appreciate uh, what was about to happen to them. BlackBerry thought it was fake. Um, Mike Lazaridis and I'm blanking on his partner, uh, his partner's name, but they thought it was fake, that it was impossible, that the whole thing had to be battery. They were right. <laughs> the whole thing was battery. <laughs> but they just couldn't imagine that. You had no keyboard and no, no pin because that was the, their entire world. Right. And, of course, uh, we've learned since from a number of articles about from engineers who were <laughs> drinking heavily during that January <laughs> demo that the demo of that device, that device was barely functional. It was completely rigged. Yeah. <laughs> each, each feature that he showed on stage was a different iPhone rigged just to perform that one stunt. <sighs> mm. Hysterical. Yeah, yeah there for, was for, for, there sorry, was a great New York Times uh, magazine piece on uh, 
on on the be, you know the beginning of the iPhone that came out. Let me see what uh, Fred Vogelstein wrote it in 2013, six years later. Um, and and you know he's talking with an engineer who said we would every time one feature would be demoed, the engineer who wrote that feature would have a yeah. take a shot because <laughs> they, they were all like, you know. I mean, there there is intense pressure, and it really, it's amazing if you watch the video, which is widely available on YouTube, of uh, Steve introducing that new iPhone. It it went very smoothly. It was incredibly impressive. It was a golden path. Yeah, yeah there was and only was, one way he, he could do it. He was a master of keynotes, and that was, I think, him at the height of his craft. That was probably one of the best he'd ever done. Yeah, mm. I still remember that awesome, awesome moment. I know it's you guys all have it by heart, where he said, "We're introducing three new products today: <laughs> a phone." an internet terminal, and a media playback device. And then he said it again, a phone, an internet terminal, and a media playback device. And he, he gradually yeah. became aware that they were all the same thing. I guess I Are could, you getting uh, it yet? I could probably, you uh, it I could yet? probably play that. I don't know what we're going to do about the audio uh, here. I'll just turn it up really loud and point my mic. We're, have, we're trying a new system with the Mac here, but I'll just play a little bit of it so you can hear it and watch it as Steve introduces it. Oh, 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 let me unmute. Oh, that's it. That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah yep. let, me, let me unmute so we can hear it. And the engineers behind Keynote phone. were drinking too. A phone. <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod. <laughs> a phone. <laughs> Are you getting it? <laughs> I still get chills. These are not. I know. Three separate devices. This is one device. Yeah. And we are calling it iPhone. And I, you know, it, it stops there, but it, I, I remember, you know, I'm, you're a journalist, so you're supposed to sit on your hands and not cheer. I, I think we all leapt to our You're feet. You're a person. <laughs> well, yeah. Scott Forstall did, did an interview at the Computer History Museum, the first time I've ever seen him do an interview since he left Apple. And he was saying that it all started with Steve having dinner with a friend of Lorene's and her, her friend's husband worked at Microsoft and he kept telling Steve, yeah, we got tablet PC coming with a stylus. We're going to own the future of mainstream computing. And Steve just got angrier and angrier <laughs> and then came and told Scott that there's no way he's surrendering the future of computing to Microsoft and a stylus. And that kicked off the entire Purple Experience project. And we, that was the uh, that was the, the uh, keynote where Steve talks about styluses and doesn't like yeah. it. He said you have to whittle your finger down. And I mean, there were all sorts of crazy uh, ideas. Yuck. Yuck. And there's still, yeah, to this said, day, there is no uh, stylus on an iPhone. There is on the iPad. Those but were resistive styluses, too. Like, you had to compress the two layers of the screen down in order for them to trigger a touch event. It was very different than what an Apple Pencil is or a Wacom right. uh, pen is today. Oh, that was awful. Mm. Oh, they were awful. Well, but it, but it worked for what the technology had to be at that time. Yeah. Uh, and also, I mean, the, the excitement in that room was that huge because it, it's not as though this came out of the blue. Uh, it's uh, the, the, maybe there were some controlled leaks or some they wanted to sort of like prepare the ground beforehand. Everybody knew that Apple was working on a phone and that the release was imminent and that at the time the uh, because do, hosting their own events was not a very uh, frequent thing that January would be a very very likely date for that to happen. I I distinctly remember the 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 closest I ever came to like. Uh, switching my switching my uh, my broad excuse me my, my mobile provider was long long story but horrible customer service incident with uh, with AT and T and then this was like in August or September of that year thinking that okay. I really want to. I really want to switch to some other provider because I'm so mad about how badly they handled this. And then, like the dad voice in my head came back and said, "Now you know that the rumors are that AT&T is going to be the exclusive carrier for the iPhone that's coming up sometime in the next few months. Do you really want to shoot yourself in the foot by having to come crawling back in three months later to go to go and do that?" So that that's why there was so much energy in the room there already. To, and then when you talk about how the, the power that Steve had to when he was when when he had something that he knew he had like all the cards in his hand that when he would he would the way that he would play those cards would just absolutely double whatever energy was inside that room uh, to to uh, to an amazing extent. Um, 
the, but the, the other thing I just wanted to say is that um, it's become part of lore that the devices were barely functional. And that's true. There was a goal. There was a golden path. But um, in my briefing after uh, Steve's keynote, uh, I had they they let me they just let, I had 45 minutes and I just basically they, they put one of these uh, iPhones in my hand and I basically said, wow. OK, there's there, there there's coffee. <laughs> go, go have a cookie. That's, I just want to play with this for 10 or 15 hell. minutes. I'm surprised. Well, I'm sure I'm sure I got one of the ones that could only do Wi-Fi because uh, it was I was mostly using I, I was going through the interface uh, and I was and I was uh, playing with the Wi-Fi that worked just fine. Uh, rarely did I get to like I, I remember that I wanted to like use the keyboard and uh, uh, see what the Notes app was like, and that that was one of the apps that I tapped it and went to basically a JPEG <laughs> of of what that app would <laughs> look like. But but the thing is, they you're right. It was they must have been confident in what. <laughs> what this thing was able to do with this one specific piece of hardware because it was fast, it was liquid, it did not stutter, it did not uh, crash whatsoever. Uh, so it's not as though this thing was uh, like like that uh, like that scene in uh, Tucker the movie where they they're about to demonstrate they're about to show off this great new car, but meanwhile while they're having singing dancing people on the stage, they're desperately trying to get the wheels to actually turn. So it wasn't as bad as that. But uh, I, it still made a hell of a first impression, even like on the day of the keynote. Uh, quote, I, I have to Tony agree Fidel that the, was talking the, about the original. Sorry. Go ahead, uh, David. Uh, oh, I was just going to say, I have to agree that one of the best things about it that we all take for granted now is the the polish and the animations. When, on the 10th anniversary of the iPhone, a couple of years ago, I did a story for CBS Sunday Morning where we tracked down the engineer who programmed the inertial scrolling so he's the one who came up with that idea that, that you can very click cool. and the list would gradually yeah. slow down yeah. as though, yeah. you know, by friction. And I mean, it was filled with little things like that. Those are the things Apple. that make the difference. That's Apple right there in a nutshell. Yeah, right? that's right. That's, and that's what made it so much better than the early Android phones and stuff. They would, you know, try to yeah. sort of recreate that, but they didn't nail it. They didn't nail the inertia or the gravity or the rubber stretching effect. That's what Renee calls yeah. painting the back of the fence, right? They they were really yeah. good at doing it. Well, that. it was funny because Tony Fidel was talking about, they had P1 and P2. They had two competing projects because they didn't think they could get P2, which was the iPhone out in a fast enough time frame, even though it ended up being that way. But they had an iPod phone too. And Tony Fidel was talking about it earlier this week because of the anniversary and saying, yeah, it worked great, except if you didn't have the phone number and contacts and you had to use the <laughs> iPod control as a rotary phone dial. Oh, and then geez. they realized it just, it just wasn't going to work. No, that was a good. joke. Everyone, no, all the rumors before, like, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm saying, no, that, that's every joke. Oh, well, haha, yes, of course. Of course. This oh, yeah, you remember the like fake. Have a, yeah, in fact, Steve showed yeah. it in the keynote. He showed an yeah. iPod with a dial on it. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, he said, not this. Uh, from Fred Vogelstein's uh, Times uh, piece, which you should read. It's still online. The iPhone could play a selection of a song or a video, but it couldn't play an entire clip reliably without crashing. This is the January demo. It worked fine if you sent an email and then surfed the web, but if you did those things in reverse, it might not. <laughs> Hours of trial and error had helped the iPhone team develop what engineers called, as you said, Renee, the golden path, a specific set of tasks performed in a specific way in order that made the phone work. He, his source on this was uh, Apple engineer Andy Grignon, who said at first it was really cool to be at the rehearsals at all, kind of like a cred badge. Only a few f chosen few were allowed to attend, but it quickly got at the rehearsals very uncomfortable. <laughs> very rarely did I see him become completely unglued. It happened, but mostly he just looked at you and very directly <laughs> said in a very loud and stern voice, you are effing up my company. Or if we fail... It will be because of you. Can you imagine that? Oh. I, oh, he was just very intense. And you always would feel an inch tall. Grignon, like everyone else at rehearsals, knew that if those glitches showed up during the real presentation, Jobs would not be blaming himself for the problems. It felt like we'd gone through the demo a hundred times. And each time, each time in these rehearsals, something went wrong. Each time. They had AT&T, the iPhone's wireless carrier, bring in a portable tell sour, cell tower, tell sour, <laughs> cell tower, so they knew reception would be strong. Then with Jobs' approval, they, get this, pre-programmed the phone's display to always show five bars regardless. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, yeah, I understand that. 
Uh, none of these kludges fixed the iPhone's biggest problem. It often ran out of memory and had to be restarted if made to do more than a handful of tasks at a time. So Steve had a number of demo units on stage with him, which I don't, I didn't notice. Did any of you notice him swapping out? He has no. delicate fingers. Leo. He, yes. To manage the problem. If, if memory ran low on one, he'd switch to another while the first was restarted. Given how many j demos jobs planned, Grignon worried that there would be far too many potential points of failure uh wow what what an it's a special I had a friend a, there and they were saying right before the event like right before he went up on stage he gathered them all together and said just remember this moment because this is the last moment without an iphone and then just walk yeah out the world is <laughs> wow and that is true the world changed that day yeah that's really true uh you can look oh, back now 13 years and uh whether it's an iphone or an android device We've got supercomputers in our pockets that are always yeah. connected. And they're to the all internet. Linux. They're all Linux based and they're all <laughs> Conqueror based. And every one of, I think at least I thought it was going to be a Microsoft Windows phone and uh, yeah. Explorer future. And now it's all Nix and Conqueror. And I don't understand what happened. Yeah. Although yeah. all of today's ills were also launched that day. I mean, <sighs> social media and the hate communities and privacy loss and data harvesting and our kids lost their screens and on and on and on. So. The world did bifurcate that day. It changes the world, yeah. Um, we, we debate this constantly on all of our shows, most significantly Jeff Jarvis and I on uh, This Week in Google. When, the, when all of this first started, even predating the iPhone, when the internet first became widely used, I think we all had this kind of utopial notion that, you know, this is going to democratize speech. This is going to change yeah, the world education. for the better. Everybody's going to have access to information at their fingertips. Yeah, uh, there. You know, the the barriers that divide us will tumble because we can communicate freely with each other and not be in ignorance about each other. And to some degree, that's true. I don't think anybody anticipated the nightmare that the last seven days have brought us. It well, turns out it's, it's us, Leo. It's not the tools. It's always it's been people. not the tools. It's always it's, been us. There's a rock, and that rock can do wonderful things, yeah. but it can also do terrible things, and we get to make that choice every yeah. moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think if you said, uh, in two, well, first of all, nobody was using Twitter. <laughs> Actually, they were. Twitter came out in 2006. Yeah. So, yeah, I was using SMS. Twitter before the uh, iPhone came out, come to think of it. Yeah. Uh, but it, nobody had any idea what Twitter would be, nor that 13 years later, the president of the United States would be banned <laughs> from and using Facebook it. Facebook was a site for Mark Zuckerberg to post, like, hot or not, basically, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, really. I mean, in a way, think of think of the other big news, Apple news this week, which is, you know, Apple Apple pulling Parler off the App Store. In a way, it's bookends of the same freedom of speech story, right? There was the iPhone that made it possible for us all to be together to say whatever we want to the whole planet at once. And then that kind of went south in some ways. And now they're pulling off one of its children from yeah. the App Store. Although given Parler's security problems, I think everyone on that service is probably grateful it's not up right now. Well, it, it, you know, in fact, Denise Howell made this point, who's our former uh, This Week in Law host, uh, uh, lawyer herself, that all of the companies that are doing this, but whether it's blocking the president or QAnon or pulling down Parler like Amazon Web Services have done, are doing it, you know, partly out of policy perhaps and civic you know, duty, but mostly because they're ex for their exposure. They don't. Yes. They they oh. don't want to be responsible. Uh, in fact, Parler's already suing AWS for billions of dollars, but they don't. They felt Although like they their were, lawyers quit. So yeah, I know suing with what I don't know. He wrote <laughs> he wrote it himself. But uh, I mean, they have plenty of money. They got Mercer money. So, but yeah. the point is. It, it may not have been a courageous act. It may have been that the lawyers came into the executive suite and said, you know what? You're exposed here if you keep doing this. You can't let, let this stay on your platform. Well, part, part of it is also the fact that uh, this the incidents from the last week gave a lot of these companies the le actually the legal cover that they need to deplatform them where they can say well why did you, uh, did you did, did you pull the plug because you don't like what we're saying and well no we didn't like what you're saying for a long long time however legally speaking we can now say that you are creating you're creating a dangerous situation you're also tarnishing our brand with your association and those are all things in that 80 page uh, uh, click through agreement that even uh, 
uh, CEOs don't necessarily <laughs> they're supposed to have lawyers look at. But there's there's language in there that basically says that if you are if your reputation is going to bring down our reputation, we can back out of this deal and you can sue. But this is the reasons why we're doing it. You can't just simply say that we don't like you. So this is this is part of the by the dominoes we're all coming down in the same week. Yeah. Do you guys think Parler will survive? There's also a lot of. Uh, yeah, they've, they've, they I were think using they've, free, they, this is the problem with all of this stuff. When 4chan went away, there was 8chan, you know, uh, yeah. the internet, the community is, is will survive. self healing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so it's whack-a-mole. I don't uh, survive. There's yes. One thing that I think will it survive in such a public fashion, uh, so that it's so easy to get to uh, maybe not, you know? But uh, but there There's will always be, th unfortunately, there will always be these back halls. I mean, you set up a dis Discord server or a Matrix server, a Signal group. There's nothing you that go can to yeah. yeah. There's nothing that can stop you if you if you're so really? motivated. And in fact, in some ways, I'm concerned about this because uh, a lot of stuff that was happening in the open in Parlor and could be monitored is now going to be com go completely oh. dark. A lot, a lot of that's. A lot of that stuff has already been seen moving towards, believe it or not, like uh, message boards for like California sports teams that they and a lot of these organizations, they don't know that they are essentially hosting yeah. a rallying point for former uh, hackers, radical members of power. Hackers were using World of Warcraft chat. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. you can't. Well, you that's know. Xbox Live, right? That's famous yeah. too for radicalization, especially yeah. for ISIS radicalization. Yeah. So it's, um, the uh, other thing that is, one thing I think that gets conflated a lot too is, and this is the analogy I came up with, so it may not be great, but you know, if if I go to visit Leo and we go to Denny's together, and I cause a huge ruckus, like I say horrible things, I act in a terrible manner, they can't ban me for being Canadian, but they can ban me for being a jerk. And those are two very different things. Like you can't really take action on on what somebody is, but you can do action on what somebody does. Uh, and that always seems to get conflated in these sorts of conversations. Yeah. I thought there are no jerks in Canada. <laughs> there aren't. They're very polite. Actually, we, I'll we be just, honest. We keep, them, we keep them out of the spotlight. Uh, I think that this is the case, that what happens is there is this veneer of politeness and courtesy and niceness. But underneath is a seething cauldron of resentment and, and <laughs> anger at being so suppressed. Right, Renee? No, I mean, Canada See, is a microcosm. Can't Alberta, he can't even admit it. He can't even admit it. I Alberta's know what's there. very similar to Texas, and the Maritimes are very similar to New England. We just have a sparsely populated version of America spread very thin. <laughs> yeah. Like not enough butter it's on It's bizarro much America. No, I love Canada. In yes. fact, uh, I had I was, so much fun doing shows up there in both Toronto and Vancouver. I fell in love with the country. But we had a bunch of a, a bunch of politicians also who had to very quickly walk back some of the things that they'd been saying oh, yeah. this week and Humans. post about it and try to Humans. hold Humans. Yeah. That's the problem, not the iPhone. Yeah, Humans. It always is. It's Even really, for security, Leo, like if there's no humans, the security system is perfect. Yeah. It's when you introduce humans that it's a problem. It's amazing. It's actually amazing to me, but it is the story of humanity that we can create such beautiful objects of, of art and technology, such amazing things like the iPhone, and then just do so many horrible things, you know, in, 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 with it. So that's a human story, isn't it? If, if anything, that demonstrates how relevant and, uh, and appropriate the technology is. If it's up to, and I'm, I realize that I'm making a very intellectual statement here as opposed to a practical one. But the fact that even, for lack of a better word, the dopes and dregs of society find a, find a way to use this and find a way to empower themselves with it shows how accessible and successful this basic technology is. And unfortunately, uh, you can't simply see you, – it, it would be a, a, an example of a, of a – uh, fascist kind of state if they said, well, here is something, here is a very, very powerful tool that can be used to give a voice to people who are marginalized or who don't have much power. Uh, we're only going to give it to people that are going to use it to create the sort of power for themselves that we find very, very convenient and very, very helpful to us personally. Uh, you really have to, if, I, I believe in the def, in that a better defini definition of society is that you do your due diligence when you create this sort of stuff. You try to anticipate problems. You try to make those mitigate those uh, those risks as much as you can. But then you have to let this thing have its own life and discover its own audience and its own purpose. And then if people abuse it, then you find a way to now we have to read this. Giving people too much control and too much power over this was 
had unintended consequences. We must now try to mitigate these consequences that we did not map out. But to simply say that we are not going to allow people to have access to a certain medical technology or a certain communications technology because we fear what would happen if this were not in the hands of the New York Times, this were not in the hands of a government, but this were in the hands of just one lonely person who doesn't feel as though they're being heard and has a point of view that they don't see shared in the mainstream media or by the government. That's a really, really bad and dangerous thing in itself. And the EU is going to change all of it because they're going to start – they don't like these companies regulate, like self-regulating. They want the government to regulate it and almost at a line item level. And then the two new bills that are coming look like they're going to be every bit as much a two-edged sword like the, the, um, the uh, cookie policy and the privacy yeah. GDPR have been. And – I was really I was talking interested to, to see, about this and it, see Angela Angela Merkel and uh, and uh, Macron of, of Germany yeah. and France say, oh, you know, this shouldn't be allowed. The government has to decide. Well, and of course, it, they don't have a First wanna, Amendment there. Yeah, the First I mean, Amendment is incompatible with a lot of the laws that e, <laughs> that EU is proposing. Like fundamentally incompatible. Yeah, Germans um, wonder they, and, because they've banned all Nazi. Uh, memorabilia and talk and so forth. They they wonder that we allow this kind of stuff. Well, Canada doesn't have a First Amendment either. Like we have yeah. hate crime laws. There's no functional, and we also don't have an, a, a version of um, Section 230 that allows for the moderation right. of all these things. So it's lucky for Canadian internet users that America has one, because otherwise a lot of these networks would just not allow us to use them because of fear right. of litigation. I mean, it seems like for a long time, social media chugged on not doing anything on on this uh, First Amendment basis. Right? We can't stifle free speech. And so they they sort of erred that way. And then things got really bad. And now Twitter and Facebook are saying, I guess there is a line that you can cross where we're where we believe we should muzzle you. But now the I mean, the, the question was always, what is the line and who should decide where it is? Right. And the social media companies were always like, it's not us. We're just the telephone company. We're not the people Except who speak Except for nipples. It. Like you've never been able to post a nipple on Facebook. <laughs> They're fine with that, with that rule. But what I'm saying is that them, the other them banning Trump and, and saying, okay, you're not allowed to spread lies. You're not allowed to spread misinformation. I mean, these are new lines being drawn and it doesn't really solve the, the question between free speech and and muzzling. I mean, yeah. we, we've gone the other way now, but you could still argue both sides. I, I don't like, I am glad we have the First Amendment. And I don't agree with Merkel or, or Macron that we that the government should decide what can be said and not said in the public sphere. I, well, the First Amendment is just for governments. Like the First Amendment has nothing to do with companies. Companies are considered like individuals. Like I can't go to your house and start screaming obscenities or you can kick me out. And companies have that exact same policy. They are under no... There is there is no compel, compulsion for companies to allow any speech. No, they I understand can, they that. Can do literally but anything they want. But most people don't. So most people think that that companies are supposed to protect freedom of speech, and it's supposed to protect freedom no. of companies yeah. from the government affecting right. their freedom to control their platform. No, but I I understand that. But that's why I'm. Uh, it makes me so nervous when Merkel says, "No, no, we should have we should have laws." I don't know. Maybe that's what we should have. We should have laws that say you. You can't say that, which would be, of course, in, in contradiction of the, of the First Amendment. Yeah, there, there, There's something that I keep flashing back on is that a lot of the things that we see as sacrosanct in each country are the result of decisions that could have gone either way hundreds of years ago. Uh, even with even the concept of, uh, of uh, an accused criminal being innocent until proven guilty, there are positive ways to simply say, guess what? The community agrees that you're a really, really big danger. Everybody knows that you did this. You have to prove that you're innocent of this charge, and we're going to imprison you until you've proven that yourself that yourself to be innocent. The other way, we did we decided that that was not the right way to go. Thank that goodness. we would much rather simply assume innocence, and yep. the, and this, uh, the government has to prove guilt. But remember that if this decision had been made differently, uh, three hundred years, two or three hundred years ago, and the the legal uh, the uh, legal foundations that we copied ours from hundreds of years before that, we would be having the discussion about, gee, maybe it's a bad thing that uh, that we were imprisoning so many people just on the basis of uh, we don't know we don't know if they are uh, they're too dangerous to the public to be allowed to to exist anymore. Free speech is the exact same thing. We made a decision that we don't we uh, the the founders of this country were so paranoid 
about uh, power being aggregated by a few people who probably are were in a prestigious uh, a, a prestigious position uh, at birth and at the, at the start of their careers that they decided to put as many limits on that power as possible and that's why again the government does not have the ability to simply say we are going to put we're going to essentially run the communications networks of the entire country this is what we're seeing in China uh, we so if there's something that we don't approve of uh, we can simply say you can, you can't say that anymore they could have gone the other way but we have to decide if are we truly committed to this or is this something that we just simply inherited are we going to just just as children at some point uh, uh, make that decision of, am I going to continue to go to church every Sunday because I am a believer in this faith, or am I going to continue going to church every Sunday because uh, this is just simply something that I've always done since the, uh, since I was uh, being brought to church as a little child? Free speech is that church. We have to decide whether we want to be a member of that church or whether we have decided that, no, this is just something we were doing out of course of habit. Well, uh, that analogy falls apart, of course, on the free speech issue because – if you allow unfettered free speech on social media, people die. Yeah, I think that's the issue. Yeah. Here. Well, no. I've, I've, well, and that's I've, what, and then that's my, the my that's point, the, the argument in favor of the way we do it, which is, uh, you know, and you can't force Twitter to moderate, but I think uh, at some point Twitter says, well, you know, we got to draw the line uh, somewhere. You can't shout. Yeah. Actually, you can shout the fire in a crowded theater. It turns out that's a that's wrong, but uh, but it, the no idea there is laws. danger. There's there is some, some speech that is limited. There are limits on some speech. Yeah, no, I, and, I, I agree uh, with that. All, all, all I was saying is that just remember that that was a choice that was made, and that we have to decide. We we, we always what some of the most dangerous stuff that happens is when you do things out of simply because it's always been done, and you forget the reasons why you do it. Yeah. Because sometimes sometimes doing that, making that 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 reassessment, will remind yourself of why you are suffering so much before this principle. But sometimes. Sometimes it will also remind you that, well, gee, actually, this principle was i it was something that seemed to make sense to me 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. It doesn't make sense now. Perhaps I should revisit that opinion. That's all I was saying. Yeah. And a lot of this comes from the old AOL and CompuServe lawsuits when there was a bunch of confusion about if you if you did any form of moderation, suddenly you were responsible for all the content. And then that's not legally viable. Your company can't survive that way. So you have to stop either doing any moderation or you have to moderate to a, a beyond silly extent. And even then, you know, your, your company will probably fold. And that's that's how they evolved into these, the sort of moderation policy they have now. And it doesn't even have to be good. That's the whole thing here is that you don't even have to have, like Twitter has proven, Facebook has proven, you can have the world's worst moderation. All you have to do is prove that you have moderation and you get all the protection. Yeah. Um, I will say this for Parler though. World's best name. Parlay <laughs> is yeah. French. No, I Parlay. Parlay. Yeah. And it's like the Parlay. parlor of a room. It's parlor clever. Room. Yeah, it's very clever. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, all their data has been dumped now, so they're. It, I, I believe it's all it's all been archived at this point now too, which is yeah. parlor and logged, baby. Yeah. That has that, yeah. see, that and that has its own like pluses and minuses. I'm I'm glad that the I'm glad that we have a permanent record of people who are who would probably be deleting lots and lots of posts because they suddenly realize that oh perhaps the reason why I for, I saw myself as a flag we've fly waving patriot gun waving let's kill them all hang them all person ah that's right I'm actually a member of Congress and I could really face horrible horrible consequences for having done so that should be preserved but I'm the uh, I'm. I have a pro I do have a problem alongside that with a lot of data that was that people posted on po on parlor including location data that they posted with the understanding that it would be never shared with the public it would only be shared with the actual host themselves I don't like the idea of that being uh, that being exposed or rather I'm, I'm worried about the consequences of personal private information like that being exposed well, I think that was my greater point is that the, the, the as a service they did not have a uh, con a right. content moderation policy that was effective. They had no security. Like people didn't even have to break into this. They just waltzed in yeah. through the API. They were using trial versions of software. Like this <laughs> would not be acceptable for like almost any product that you'd want to use. Like I would never use a product like that. Didn't matter what the product is. Let's take a little break. We'll come back with um, more in just a bit. It's really nice to have David Pogue joining us. He was on the first Mac Break Weekly. Now he's on the last. No, no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. It's not, geez, I could start something. Uh, it's good to see you. New book coming out. Find out about all his uh, uh, new books at David Pogue, P -O -G -U -E dot com. Really nice to have you, David. Thank uh, you, sir. Of course, Andy Anako from the 
WGBH in Boston. I have no idea how to spell his name, I-H-N-A-T-K-O.com. And Renee Ritchie from Renee Ritchie, <laughs> YouTube.com. <laughs> the eponymous. The eponymous Renee Ritchie, YouTube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Our show today brought to you by ExpressVPN. I think by now everybody understands why you would want a VPN. I'll run through the reasons in just a bit. The real question is which VPN? There are a lot of VPN providers, some free, some cheap, some log you, some inter I actually VPN providers that add, put ads into your stream so you get more ads on a website. Uh, that's not ExpressVPN. That's the one I use. That's the one I recommend. I did a lot of research and I'll explain why in a second. So First of all, let's talk about what ExpressVPN can do for you. Uh, of course, everybody knows that if you're at an open Wi-Fi access point, like a coffee shop, an airport, a hotel, a cruise ship, uh, that you're at risk because you're on a network unprotected with a lot of other people, including that guy in a hoodie in the corner who seems to be doing something odd with his laptop in a strange box. Uh, the VPN encrypts your data from your computer all the way to the VPN server. So that's good for security. It turns out, though, there's also a privacy aspect to it. Internet service providers, certainly that coffee shop, uh, your, your mobile carrier, all can log what you do online. And it's completely legal for them to sell that information to marketers. And in fact, many do. So if you want true privacy, a VPN protects you that way. As well, there's a third reason a lot of people use VPNs these days. We've all, you know, run out of things to watch on Netflix. If you use ExpressVPN, it's fast enough that you can watch Netflix in Japan or Netflix in England. See all the Doctor Who episodes you'd ever want, uh, thanks to ExpressVPN. It lets you move your location to anyone. They're in almost a hundred countries. They're all over the world. They have many, many servers all with a lot of bandwidth. That's why you want a good VPN provider. But here's the most important part. When we talk about security and privacy, sure, you're protecting against yourself against a coffee shop or your internet service provider, but the same way a coffee shop and ISP can see what you're doing, so can a VPN provider. You're just kicking the can down the road. And that's why I highly recommend ExpressVPN. They don't log. They keep no track of you. And, and, and they get audited regularly by PricewaterhouseCoopers. So we know that's true, that their privacy policy is accurate. And they use a technology, they're so committed to this, called Trusted Server, something they created that runs in memory. So when you press the big button on your ExpressVPN app on your iPhone or Android, Mac, PC, you can even put ExpressVPN on uh, many routers. When you push that big button, ExpressVPN spins up in RAM only the Trusted Server, it cannot write to the hard drive. It cannot log, cannot log what you're doing. It's sandboxed. And then when you exit the VPN, it disappears and poof, so does every record of your visit. And again, fully audited by uh, an independent and very highly respected PricewaterhouseCoopers. So you know it's protecting your privacy, okay? That's why I choose ExpressVPN. I'm not alone. It's the number one VPN uh, rated that way by Wired, by CNET. Um, it, I've been using it for a long time now, and it's fast enough to watch HD video anywhere in the world, and I think that's really important. Protect your privacy, your security. With a VPN, I trust to keep me private online. You could even run it on your router, have your whole house protected, and I guarantee you nobody's going to complain because ExpressVPN is fast. Stop handing over your personal data to ISPs who mine your activity and sell off your information. Visit expressvpn.com slash MacBreak, E-X-P-R-E-S-S, vpn.com slash MacBreak, expressvpn.com slash MacBreak. You get three extra months free with a 12-month plan that brings it down below 7 bucks a month. I think that's a good price for the best VPN provider out there. ExpressVPN.com slash MacBreak. We thank them so much for supporting MacBreak Weekly. We thank you for supporting it, dear listener and viewer, by using that address. I know you could go there and not use that address, but get the extra three months and, and, and we get a little benefit too. ExpressVPN.com slash MacBreak. So... Did Hyundai make a strategic mistake? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, whoopsie. <laughs> whoopsie. Because, you know, when you're working with a partner, it's a good idea to understand the partner's, you know, peccadillos, concerns, issues. Hyundai said, yeah, we're talking to Apple about building a car for them. 
and then shortly afterwards said, uh, never mind. <laughs> What's a car? What's what? a car? Car? No, no cars. No. <laughs> Never so, heard of them. Uh, I, I, you know, honestly, I think Hyundai probably is talking to Apple. Hyundai said, and and lots of other people are too. It, it's not. It's not just us. Uh, it's interesting because there's been this drumbeat over the last few weeks. Yes, Apple is making a car. We had thought that the the project was kind of on the back burner. Project Titan. We we had thought maybe they'd gotten rid of a lot of people, and then they were started hiring people again. Um, Hyundai says, um, we've been contacted by potential partners for the development of, a, of autonomous electric vehicles. You know, they, their stock went up 19%. They're in cahoots yeah. with big Which is why they said it. <laughs> so, and I can just see Apple saying, hey, you know what, Hyundai? Forget about it. <laughs> if you're going to be that way, <laughs> forget about it. Um, but it does it, can, Renee, does it <laughs> confirm the rumor that Apple is in this business to make a car or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I again, I go back to like, can you imagine? And David mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the iPhone announcement. There just wasn't this level of scrutiny back then because otherwise it would have been Steve Jobs livid demands a tablet project, tablet project in chaos, switching right. to phone, two right. competing <laughs> phones vying good for Steve's point. attention. Good Tony point. Fidel incensed. Steve goes with the other phone. Yeah, that's a very good point, isn't it? Yeah. Um, the, the the thing that raised my uh, my BS detectors on this story was the timeline. They want to ship a car in 2024? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. You can't, I mean, there's no way. First of all, if you want to do self-driving, which is the other part of this story, I mean, Tesla's been at it full-time for years and years and years and still haven't completely licked full self-driving. So Apple's going to start from zero and, and have something in three years? No, it's not going to happen. Especially if it's Siri. I'm not going to let Siri drive me uh, anywhere. Siri, <laughs> drive me home. Uh, here's what I found on the web about that. <laughs> uh, Mark Gurman and Bloomberg say, saying in response to all of this, this was a couple of days ago, Apple will take at least half a decade to launch an autonomous electric vehicle. We've seen dates ranging from that crazy 2024 Tomorrow. <laughs> to, to 2028. Um you know, I'm in the market for a new electric vehicle, but I'm not going to wait for the Apple car, I don't think. You think the phone started ringing while the guy was still talking to the media? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm working so with Apple stupid. on a car, and it's ringing, and it says so, T. Cook on it as, as so he's talking. So stupid. Even if yeah. their stock went up $8 billion, so, so stupid. Yeah, because yeah, his well, next call is not the Hyundai. Yeah. You know, also, the, the the levels of uh, of autonomy on self driving cars, every step above the next to the next level is twice as hard as cumulatively what it was before. The the difference between high automation and full automation is gigantic, and this is why we're seeing so much movement in uh, trucking, for instance, vehicles autonomous vehicles that will spend almost all their time on highways as opposed to uh, local surface streets. It's anytime someone gives you a predicted date of when they're going to have a fully autonomous vehicle out there that's that does raise your, your bs detector i haven't because... tried tesla's most recent autonomous but uh, i always felt like i was taking my life in my hands i'd i'd have my hands on the wheel and be staring as that slowly yeah. veered into the median strip uh, some car makers like cadillac uh and i think my mustang when it gets self-driving in the middle of uh, this year um have cameras in the wheel or in the car to make sure you're looking and uh, uh, and will only work on already mapped highways. That seems a little bit safer. Uh, you know, Tesla keeps I, I promising, oh, we're going to be able to do it from, and you know. And maybe not curb. when it's snowing. Maybe if it's snowing, we yeah. think that's a wall, so we're just going to yeah. not okay. let you drive. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, so I'm a Tesla Model 3 owner. I dearly love this thing. I use it self-driving, such as it is, every single drive. The car with 100% reliability and no false starts will do the following. It will take the ramp onto the, once you put it in an address, it'll so get on. the So you turn it on on city streets? You don't, you yes, don't wait course. to the highway? Oh my God. Of course, it, it, the, it's, it's capable of taking the exit onto the highway, taking all the interchanges necessary, all automatically complete with signaling and lane changing. And then when you finally get to the exit ramp, um, it gets into the exit lane, puts on the signal, wow. slows down to the appropriate amount and takes the exit, comes to a gentle stop at the light at the end of the exit ramp. By the way, do you know how it knows what speed to take that particular exit ramp? 
It has collected the data from all the other manually driving Tesla owners and averaged the speed that those humans take those exits at. And so that's what it feeds your car. And it's incredible, incredible. So yes, there is now a release of a beta of the full self-driving. This is the one where- Will you use you that? Speed. I don't have the beta, so I haven't used it. But last but would week- Would you? I, yeah, I would. Wow. I mean, for the first couple of weeks, I'd stay alert and keep my hands ready. Uh, but a you guy posted- David, you don't get in the back seat and take a nap. You, you can't do that. He dropped the knife one in the cab. He's fearless, Leo. <laughs> okay. You, you can't do it. Well, no, I one know. Thing, the uh, Tesla requires you to show that you're still there. Oh, I know. About one minute. Yeah. My so, Model X would uh, almost every time start getting angry at me and eventually put up a red warning saying, you can't use self-driving until you get home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you ignore its alerts, it deprives you of the future. Yeah, and I would always miss it because it wasn't that you know clear. And I had my hands on the wheels, but it doesn't use capacitance or anything. You actually have to torque the wheel a little bit. And hey, I, Leo, here's a tip for you and all the other Tesla owners. It doesn't, when it says, please jiggle the wheel to show that you're still there, yeah. you don't have to do that. You can use any control to show that you're there, including just adjusting the volume oh. on the wheel. Oh. So I just go, Boop, and that, that's enough. Oh, I wish I'd known that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Just use your thumb. And anyway, so last week, um, a guy posted a video of him driving from San Francisco to LA yeah. using the new beta, full self-driving. Once something fell off the car in front of him right into the lane and he grabbed the wheel. Yeah. But that was the only time that there was any question that it was flawless. Wow. There's a video of it on YouTube. It's time lapse. It's and there wasn't cool. a Tesla in front of him. It was not a Tesla in front of him. That's the important part. Mm. See, that's a, the, 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 the diff that's where the difficulty lies, though. That I, I, I have two problems. I have, I have two problems with uh, the current level of, of, of self-autonomous vehicles. Number one is that you're asking somebody to, I'm going to, I'm going, you're asking the, the main public to play, turn over all the driving decisions to the, the system, but nonetheless still maintain mentally present and alert, which I think is a big challenge, particularly for people who are doing the same like hour long, 90 minute drive, uh, 90 minute commute every single day. I think they're two kind of competing things. Maybe the next generation of drivers will be able to balance that very very, very well. I don't know. The other problem is that we have to have an attitude. We, it, it will, even when these systems are perfect, not just for highway stuff, which is predictable. There's, it's very, very rare that you'll have someone deciding to cross the road, uh, walking a bicycle across a three, three lane highway. Uh, but when it becomes good enough that we could really, really trust it on surface, on local surface streets, uh, and it is designed to be perfect that way, we're going to have to be okay with the idea that there are still going to be fatalities that are created by cars, only there will be far fewer of them because they're being created by software as opposed to by a distracted driver. But we're going to have to make that sort of adjustment in our society's heads by saying, yes, this piece of software killed a person, technically speaking. Uh, and we have to be okay with that as opposed to here's the person that we can blame, the person who decided they were going to be texting and drinking coffee instead of checking to see what the lights were before they proceeded through an intersection. David, so do, you, it, uh, do you do it on the same stretch of road every time or? Uh, no. No. No, okay. not at all. I'm, no, I you know, I, like I said, I have I sent my Model X back last year, so maybe they've gotten better. Uh, the Model I, 3 I mean, is I definitely I will say later. this. On, on the side streets... Um, they limit the speed to right. five miles over the speed limit. Fair and that enough. actually drives me crazy. Like people will honk <laughs> behind me. I know. If, if it's Amy Webb on Twit was 30, complaining. Honk at me. She got so, the new yeah. uh, Audi uh, e-tron sport back. And she said, every time it sees a speed limit sign, it slows me down to the speed limit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she was mad Unless, about that. I, I'm an old guy, David. I like to drive the speed limit. That's my... <laughs> That's my thing. But, that, but that's a, you're actually hitting upon something that's actually also being uh, seen as another problem that humans are creating with self-driving cars. When uh, when a human driver recognizes that another vehicle is a self-driving autonomous vehicle, they become much more aggressive against that vehicle oh, that's because terrible. they figure that they're that's not they're, they're going to be fewer reper a, a because they figure that this the 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 computer is not going to jump out of the car with a gun and start shooting them, but also that they know that this car has been programmed to do the safest, most predictable. 
thing. So if I'm going to cut someone off to try to get to an exit that I didn't think was coming up quite so soon, it's okay for me to take this. Oh, look, here's that brightly colored specific Amazon delivery van that I know has no human driver on it. I'm definitely going to cut off this person. So there's, there's a lot we're going to have to learn as yeah. these systems become uh, become deployed. And I, this, this I, is why I'm very, very like uh, bearish when it comes to ambitious predictions of when someone is going to ship a fully functional uh, autonomous vehicle. I mean, eventually the whole speed limit thing is going to go away anyway. The speed limits were designed for our human fallibility because we suck as drivers. But once the computers get good enough, yeah. they don't need that. We can be 80 miles an hour a foot from fender to fender Oh, yeah. and never have an Oh, God, David. I think, I, I think that, <laughs> you no, are I, a I, utopian. <laughs> I, I, well, talk, talk, about, talk about utopia. I think, that, I think the really big opportunity is when we start taking the lessons that we've learned from the past year, year and a half of saying, well, uh, of, of the pandemic, saying, well, we're going to shut off these streets so that we have more uh, more room for, uh, for pedestrian traffic, for pedestrian malls. And we start applying these rules towards uh, city and inter uh, intercity planning. When we have, uh, instead of HOV lanes, we have these specifically a self-driving vehicle lane you can only, you can own this own the only cars that are allowed to enter this lane physically are ones that have special transponders that identify themselves as an autonomous, autonomous vehicle and that's when you find out you that's when you do have that sort of situation where from the helicopter it looks like you have a train with 400 cars <laughs> a couple to them because you have 400 cars following each other at one foot to 18 inch intervals in perfect safety with people who are perfectly okay with reclining the seat back and, and reading a comic book uh, while the computer does the driving. I really think that that's the thing that's going to create that kind of uh, transportation utopia, but not in the next five or 10 years, but when we start to rebuild cities and rebuild transport to make it more, make it less about the horse and carriage and about the, the diesel truck and more about electronic vehicles. But Leo, to be sure, most of the public is with you. The AAA did a study last year. They asked people, asked Americans, would you take a ride in a self-driving taxi? 71% said no way. <laughs> I guess we should get over that because it truthfully, it would be safer than humans driving. It's just that the feeling the of chance. not That's... being in control and this car you know, drives into a truck is, is more terrifying than I'm in control and I drive into a truck. <laughs> That's well, all. I, I had the chance at CES two years ago, and they offered the driverless. I forget which car. Well, it was in, It wasn't Google or or uh, Tesla. Or they Waymo offered us a self-driving taxi. Or, yeah. yeah, Waymo, I think. And they offered us the the driver one, and I was I was still terrified back then. So I took the driver one, <laughs> and they got lost four times trying to just get well, us from the airport. See, that doesn't the, happen. To, yeah. to the strip. Yeah, self-driving yeah. cars don't get lost. You. I mean, I, you may I end up in you, a you in know, a packing I, crate on the way to an island, but they don't get lost. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Andy, Andy is right that it's a new skill, but I mean, we seem to have crossed the hump of learning to use cruise control right. decades ago. That's a new skill. That's that's on the way to you not being involved and yet still paying attention. Right. So this is just another flavor of that. No, and I love adaptive cruise control. I love the lane keeping. I was always a little nervous with the automatic lane change because- Maybe because the Tesla was a little more aggressive than I would have been about, you know, leaving some room. <laughs> Are they swarm enabled? Like, do Teslas know about other Teslas? Like, no, with like they have like U1 yet. chip equivalents where they all that's, they can that's move the like future. a hive of insects. That's, that's the five G future. That's what a lot of people are talking about with five G. up on other drivers. And then it will be safer if you can if cars can communicate with one another. That would be a huge improvement because then you My don't have... My driver is an a-hole. Please leave extra room. <laughs> yeah. Well, you just don't... You know, you can change lanes. You don't have to do the signal and all that stuff. The car says, can I... Uh, mind if I get in here? Yep. Okay, get in there. And it's much more safe. But, but um, did yeah. they... Does their machine learning learn to be aggressive like us and they'll go, can I change lanes? No, no. And they start to Actually, that's an interesting that's point. Jerk AI. With the training that they've been doing, I remember Google was... Uh, Google had a little fender bender with their, with their uh, self-driving vehicle because the vehicle got in a lane that there was construction and w looked back and saw a bus coming, but knew there was, you know, thought, well, I, I'll be able to get in. And the bus hit it. And, and what the Google engineer said is that's a good thing. It was a little fender bender. It wasn't nobody died or anything. It, that's a good thing because we now can tr tell our cars. Now, if it's a bus, <laughs> just yeah. assume that you're going to need a little more time 
because yeah. they're a little more aggressive. They maybe have a harder time stopping. You know, do, so that's part of the they ongoing. Know yeah, that's part of the, they're barreling down that lane. There, you're not. Don't go in there. So that's part well, of the I whole can process. Answer. I can answer the question for both Renee and Leo about the aggressiveness of the lane changes. It's a setting. So you can set, ah. dial in one of four <laughs> settings for how aggressive you want to that's, be with those. That's new. Yeah. The, the highest I, one is called Mad Max. Yeah. I remember that. That's, yeah. No, I didn't have those features. I just had to let it do what it was doing. <laughs> or Mass Pike, as we call I'm it several, here. Yeah, Mass Pike. Yeah. Is there a command I mean, like the Batman is, had in his where you can just say intimidate? <laughs> Tesla updates the software monthly, right. literally every month it's there's amazing. a new version. Yeah. And you've never had a, a car that does that before. I mean, there are new features. I, I remember a year after owning this thing, somebody at Tesla said, you know what? We have cameras at the front and we have USB jacks. I wonder if we could make that a dash cam feature. So now the Tesla has yeah. a dash cam. You just yeah. take a USB stick, awesome. put it in the jack and it's, it's yeah. recording all the time. Yeah. Uh, I'm not buying another Tesla, though. <laughs> well, Lisa won't let me for one thing, because as I've mentioned before, the, the door, the gullwing door, the Falcon doors kept hitting her in the head because they had sensors. So it was very careful about opening in a garage, you know, it would go up and, and it was able to get in, you know, tiny clearance. But it didn't, it turned out, have sensors on the bottom edge. So every <laughs> every time I would say, OK, I'm, you know, I would press the button to close all the doors and she it would go, oh. <laughs> Stop it! Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, several times. So actually, we got to the point where uh, we had a system where I would say, "Doors will close in five <laughs> seconds. Stand clear." I should have had a little. <laughs> after the after the third time that happened, she said, "You know, this is not." She she always felt like, and I think she's right. We were driving a beta of the of the <laughs> software, <laughs> and you feel that way too a little bit, right? Come on, David, admit it. It's not perfect. No, it's not. It's not perfect. Yeah, but it's, compared it's with having to do all the driving myself yep. all the time, light years. It's as Ashley Vance wrote in his book about uh, about uh, Elon Musk. It's it's uh, a Silicon Valley car. It's a car, you know. Car, traditional car manufacturers are kind of the opposite. You know, the safety first. They're very conservative. It's more. You know, it's software, and we're going to update it every month. And you know, and if there are bugs, we'll fix it, and that kind of thing. And I think that's a yeah, very that's different model. Right. Very different. Yeah. They have a totally di I mean, Tesla errs on the side of being too aggressive with this stuff. The other car companies, as you say, err on the side of being too slow and conservative. Yeah. 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 Um, we can we can also just but quickly mention that the thing that I want to, that I'm, I'm I'd like to follow as we move this transition into electric vehicles more and more state like Boston, uh, excuse me, Massachusetts, I think, is, is the latest jump on the oh, we will not. Uh, I don't know if it's, I'm sorry, I, don't, I can't remember if it's Boston or Massachusetts uh, saying that we'll not allow the sale of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles uh, after 2035 or something. California, um, it's same, California yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, but it's going to be, it's the one of the interesting effects is that uh, it, there is a point of view that a gas powered car is a very, very clean uh, environmental vehicle from the point of view of someone buys it in the showroom brand new for $60,000. Then two or three years later, when it comes off lease, someone else buys it at auction for $35,000. And then someone else buys it on a used car lot for $12,000. And then it gets handed down to family members until it just falls apart like the Bluesmobile at the end of the movie. Uh, and, and part of this is because of the availability of third party parts, the avail even the availability of that cousin of yours who knows cars to come over and fix and do your brakes for you or uh, install a new alternator. And uh, Tesla is a rather extreme example of the non-fixability of uh, a car as a platform because they do, not only do they maintain such tight control over who gets access to tools uh, and replacement parts, but also if you buy a uh, uh, if if you buy uh, certain Teslas used, like if someone spent three thousand dollars for the software option to make it do this, guess what? That was that was attached to the user license for this particular owner, and now this car that when you have sold it on does not have that three thousand dollar or their one thousand uh, dollar software patch option. So we're going to have to make sure that there's still an avenue for people who have eighteen hundred dollars. That's it for a car that can get them twenty to thirty miles to uh, to a place of work and back again every single day. And I hope that whatever future we have with uh, with super super modern super super technological cars people still have that ability or something that will replace their need to own a car that will uh, own an $1,800 uh, junker beater car because i'm not sure that we've solved that problem yet 
Google says, uh, you know, there's, there's been a little log jam in the App Store. I've noticed there are quite a few apps that are stopped updating after December 13th when Apple started requiring the yeah. privacy, you know, <laughs> statements. Uh, and we had speculated, uh, maybe it was last week, and I apologize that Google maybe hadn't updated in all that time because they didn't want to. They now say they're going to start updating. And the real reason was because it was Christmas. Uh, Google go and has done this every year. A lot of companies do. We're not going to update in December because we don't want our, st you know, if there's a showstopper, we don't want our staff to have to come to work uh, in the holidays. So we're going to wait for the update until uh, January. And Google says, in fact, uh, beginning this week, they're going to update uh, all of their iOS apps and have the full privacy report as required by Apple. I'll tell you, the privacy report really has had an impact on WhatsApp. Uh, it's uh, so before we move on from Google, though, I don't yeah. think it was wrong for us to speculate because they have been anything but quick in implementing new iOS features. It took them years to do side by side app. They still don't do picture in picture in the YouTube app on iOS. They've they've dragged their feet at every turn over the last few years. I think it's perfectly reasonable to think they're not rushing to implement uh, even mandatory new features. Yeah, yeah, it's a good thing though. I mean, uh, Signal is all of a sudden. I think one of the top um, apps in the app store because people surging. Yeah. it's surging because people look at the WhatsApp privacy policy, especially the part that says, and everything we know about you, we're going to give to Facebook and said, eh, maybe I don't want to use WhatsApp. That's going to be a tough, Forget that's a tough incumbent it. to beat. I mean, someone posted them side by side. They posted the WhatsApp oh, yeah. uh, privacy sheet. They posted the, I forget there was a third one, Telegram maybe. Messenger, and then, no, it was Facebook uh, Messenger. iMessage, which yeah. had like contacts and and two things, and Signal, which was zero knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a big difference. In fact, I I have reinstalled Signal on my phone. I I, I would use Signal if everybody I know would use Me Signal, yep. but nobody I know uses. <laughs> That's how it starts, Leo. It's us nerds, and then slowly, yeah. you know, slowly more people check it out. Yeah. Did you guys um, see that um, that editorial on Nine to Five Mac about how maybe Apple should open up iMessages? Oh, I wish to they Android would. Phones? I've been saying that for a long time. I understand so it's against their business interests, but boy. right. Well, no, but it's not trivial, it also because you no, know, but it's it's non trivial because what makes iMessage work on the iPhone doesn't really exist on Android. Like it would not be built into the default SMS app. And yes, you can make any app on Android the default SMS app, but people still have to do that, and most people don't. But they do. The that's the point. That's, that's why WhatsApp genius. is so popular on Android all over the world is because you can make it the default, and and people don't want to pay for expensive SMS messaging in other countries, and everybody they know uses WhatsApp. Uh, ex, you know, except yeah, for Asia, is, where Line and WeChat are bigger, WhatsApp is completely yeah. dominant everywhere but the U.S. Uh, I think. Yeah. Well, so, David, get, make the case for Apple. Tell, t talk to Tim, will you? And what? <laughs> t tell him why he should do this. Okay, so I, I mean, I'm, I, I don't know what I would do if I were Tim, because like the the argument for keeping it proprietary is that it's an attraction for. Apple, iPad, I mean, for Macs, iPads, and it iPhones. Yeah. Although, although, do you know anyone who's ever said, oh, yeah, I'm getting an iPhone because of iMessages? No, I'm not sure. No. It's a big draw. The like argument BBM against for is the rest of the, of the tech industry seems to want their standards to propagate. Think of the browser wars. Think of uh, Adobe PDF. I mean, they want everybody to use PDF, even though that's theirs. So, like, I don't quite understand what the standard business thinking should be. Is proprietary better or is universal standard better that you own? Somebody says that it's the Vernet X uh, lawsuit and the half billion dollar settlement. That's that, FaceTime, not uh, I understand it's FaceTime, but... but yeah. It's not iMessage. It wouldn't. It wouldn't relate to that. It wouldn't be. No, uh, but they, they, like the thing is, like Apple is not good at cross-platform, and they're not good at services. And people are asking them to make a cross-platform service for another billion users with an yeah. unclear business model and with a lack of control that they have over the security model and the integration model that they have on iOS. I think uh, the so my confidence level is low. I want to correct you because I think the Vernet XX. Uh, uh, Lawsuit was over internet communications technologies. So I think it does impact, and at least some people think it does impact mm. uh, Apple's messages as well as FaceTime. I've uh, will you summarize FaceTime that case for us, Leo? Listed so far. Uh, yes, it's been going on for eight long years. 
Um, I, I don't know if Vernet X is a legitimate, you know, uh, patent holder. I think they're one of those um, yes. patent holding companies. East Texas mm -hmm. Rocket Docket. East Texas, yes. Uh, they claimed that FaceTime, VPN on demand, and iMessage features infringe oh, four okay. patents, which they which they acquired related to secure communications. Uh, Apple obviously said no, no. Um, the and the East Texas District Court said yes, yes. The, the, it's been going on for a while. There've been multiple trials. Uh, the, eventually, it was a five hundred million dollar judgment uh, against mm. Apple. Uh, but that judgment is, in effect, royalties. So it may be it solves the problem that, well, we gave you half a billion dollars, so now we can go ahead. And they're expiring, I, I believe. Yeah, it's now or never, maybe for Vernet X. Um, maybe. So if it was a federal jury, of course, in East Texas who said, mm. you know. Uh, so my best pitch to Tim Cook would be make it iMessage Plus and you pay like a dollar or three dollars a month, and you get a special bubble color. It's not blue bubble <laughs> or green anymore. It's like orange bubble, and then everybody knows that you flex way harder than any of your iPhone or Android. You're being, I know you're being facetious, although it's an interesting. I, I just think it, it, it would bring. You would I believe it would bring people to the Apple platform. You know, remember Steve Jobs fought so hard against iTunes being on Windows when he finally yes. lost that battle. What did it do for the iPod? It exploded the market for the iPod. So I think that it's it's nothing but a benefit. And I bet you if Apple made an Android and let's please make a Windows and uh, version of it as well, if Apple made a, version, a web version that that it would uh that become rapidly become the default messaging uh package. Now, it is not I should point out as secure as it's as a signal because uh, Apple does have the keys to the encrypted messages. It's encrypted, but and and it backs up. You could turn it off, but just like WhatsApp, it backs up in the clear to iCloud. So, uh, you know, Signal is still arguably much more yes. private. Uh, but I bet you would become the default if Apple offered it, and people would love the features. I think they would love the features. But Leo, in the, in the case of the Windows version of iTunes for the iPod. That sold iPods. Right. What would this sell? Well, nothing. You're right. It's not going to... Yeah. Services <laughs> revenue. <laughs> Orange bubbles. Yeah. yeah. But, that, I, but that, that's why I say that the, the, the Apple's next priority should be to create an Android compat uh, compatibility for the Apple Watch. I absolutely yeah, don't that know would sell why watches. they're not doing that. that. Yeah. yeah, that, that would sell watches. It's because they're going to make it independent. They don't want it. You'd have to have any phone for it anymore. It's going to be the same as when they took the iPhone to iCloud and said it's PC free. Didn't matter if you had a PC or an, or a mac anymore you just needed an iphone and my understanding is they're just trying to get the apple watch to the point where it doesn't matter you don't have to have a, you don't have to have a phone if you don't want one right if all you need is a that's watch right. that's fine you can use it with anything yeah I, wow. I, 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 don't, I don't i don't even care if it's a progressive web app it's just need, there needs to be compatibility because it it becomes an increasingly bad look for apple to say that we 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 are very very proud of all the improvements we're making to humanity and the lives that we're saving for of apple customers if you are a google customer we don't really care. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's they need to uh, not not only it will sell watches, but it will also add a little bit of extra veneer of credibility to their claim that we think this is the most important mission that we have. Yeah. There's little things they don't even do. And I think like some of it is also bandwidth. Like Apple is this huge company, but they, they, they insist on this approach where they have tiny little teams. Like you still can't update AirPods on Android. You need to attach them to an iPhone. Just build that into the music app because you make Apple Music for Android. Let that app, you know, if you don't have Apple Music, that's fine. Download it. It'll update your AirPods. There's all these little things that they just feel as... It's too much for them to have to do at any given point. Yeah. Too much to yeah, maintain. See that, that's that's a, that's a shame. That's that's a skill that on the, on the Apple report card there are some cl classes in which they do get the C minus yeah. or the D. One is demonstrating that they have the ability to manage a multi-platform product because that is part of what holds them back of, as being a truly A plus great company. There are companies that simply say yes, there are huge problems in supporting a certain service or supporting a piece of hardware across multiple platforms, but that's the world. That that we live in we don't want to simply say we are really really great at creating wonderful technology so long as we control as many of the variables as we possibly can a truly great company has to be able to say 
throw what it, throw whatever you got as at us. We will find a way to deal with it. And that's something I would like to see Apple do more of just as a general thing. Three nanometers. It's just a little bit smaller. And Apple has done a deal. The marketing name. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit smaller. Uh, Apple's done a deal to offer to buy three nanometer chips from TSMC. That's their chip fab. That's who makes the current chips. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say about they that, are, except they wow. are so far ahead. Like, yeah. it, Apple bought out almost all the five nanometer process. And so like Qualcomm and NVIDIA and, ha, had to go to Samsung, whose process isn't anywhere nearly as good. Intel is still nowhere near where that is. AMD is making some really good announcements and they're getting good process. But it's it's again it's that thing where like Apple just buys so much all at one time and is willing to pay in advance and basically finance all of the the equipment for the process that they get such a high lead time on this. Intel is trying to catch up with the M1. I don't know if they'll succeed. This is of course is CES week, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, uh, it's all online. But uh, Intel has had uh, some CES announcements, including an 11th gen Rocket Lake Core i9 processor uh which does big little interest it has a big little architecture interestingly amd so looked much more impressive this morning did they and, i didn't see what they announced what was what yeah was they, they they announced a new series of laptop chips which i i don't know how they're going to parse out compared to m1 yet because you know they the, the biggest problem intel uh, sorry nvidia and amd have had is they just can't get product in people's hands you know they right. can make announcements but they have like and the, the, the all the stuff they can put out is being scalped so it's not i don't consider that ship really yet but their their laptop chips look really really good and it's people really love the, the ryzen 5000 on the desktop so a laptop yeah. version of that and and amd is saying 20 hours of battery life uh yeah. that would be very interesting it's you know i mean uh, we know pc makers lie but uh <laughs> Uh, I say but, that but with they, love. But AMD it delivers, but they they yeah. they 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 make they big have higher overhead. They take big swings. They make yeah. yeah. Uh, eight cores, sixteen threads, four point eight gigahertz boost, three point zero gigahertz base. The fifty nine eighty HS Ryzen HS twenty megs. And those names are generated cache. by a password manager, aren't they? Oh, they just man. have to be. Well, <laughs> and as you say, if you can't get it, you can't get it. But I have to say, note the TDP thirty five watts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. that's a lot more than the M1. So M1 is like what 15, 16 watts, yeah. I think, right now. Yeah. So I, we'll see. We'll see. The M1, man, it's just oh, like, isn't it awesome? When I when I joined you a couple weeks ago on Twit, Leo, I was ashamed to be the only person who still didn't have an M1 laptop. So after that episode, because I'm waiting for the one with four USB C jacks. Yes. I'm waiting for right. M2. Right. But I decided, you know what? I'll be like Leo. I'll get this one for now. <laughs> And I'll give that to my kid in the spring. There you and go. I'll get them. There you go. So I raced the Apple store online, and guess what? What? Not even <laughs> available for weeks. They yes. are completely sold out. Yes, yes, yes. It is a huge hit. Yeah. This is uh, this is the 13-inch MacBook Pro. Um, They're getting the intermittent stock, so if you check, they, they sometimes have stock of all the different SKUs. What's the holdup? Do you think it's the M1 itself, or? It looks like it's the 16 be. gigabyte is a big the RAM. bottleneck. The uh, RAM. Yeah, the 8 gigabyte ones seem to be much more available than the 16 gigabyte ones. And that's, of course, because they're putting it on the chip. It's not, you know, it's yeah. not on the die, but it's on the chip. Uh, so it's unified memory architecture. I, I, I'm with you, David. I mean, this is a stopgap. <laughs> and yet, yeah. it's yeah. a damn fine stopgap. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I can't wait to see, yeah, f you know, four Thunderbolt, four the ports, and, you know, 32 gigs of RAM and, and all of that. I have to say... Um, I have an iMac Pro, a 10-core uh, iMac Pro with 64 gigs of RAM. And is I it crying, Leo? Is it crying it's at night? crying because I turned it off. Oh! <laughs> you couldn't take the crying. You turned it's, it off. It's sleeping. <laughs> so it runs, it runs silent. Awesome. It's very quiet. <laughs> Another Apple first. Uh, it just, I mean, in some ways, of course, it's faster. But it's just a hard thing to go from an M1, even in a laptop, even in this low-end MacBook Pro 13, to that iMac Pro. They're just... It does. It yeah, feels I'm still a using Intel for my daily work because I I, I put too much pressure on a even the 16 gigabyte uh, with like big 10 bit raw files editing them every day. I I'm, I'm at the edge case, uh, so I want that new M1 yeah. X 16 inch MacBook Pro this year so badly. You'll I get will never that. Look back. You think you'll get it, it by is, March? 
I'm not sure if it's if it's not a redesign. If they do the same thing that they did with these, and that's just get the new silicon into the existing designs, I think there's a good chance we'll have it March or June, uh, any time. They could drop that in a press release because they've already done the whole right. M1 thing. But if it's a redesign, I think they're going to want it to be in an event, and then it, it's going to depend on availability, and then it'll be more likely, I think, June-ish. Yeah. But, I mean, you guys are just talking about the speed. I want the battery life. Oh, I, it's awesome. I paid three thousand dollars for this MacBook Pro, oh, stuffed to the gills with storage, and I can barely get across the yeah. country from New York to California with it. Yeah, and and yeah. me, I'm I'm using this unplugged for all day for the shows days. for days. Yeah, yeah, it's still at sixty three percent. Crazy. I mean, I've been using That's it all right. since uh, eight a.m. Uh, I'm I'm crazy. a I'm a super I'm a super cheapskate, but one of the reasons that got me for, got me buying this MacBook Pro, not just not the MacBook Air, is just the idea of having a. I don't care that it has only two uh, Thunderbolt ports. The fact that you that I conceivably have a twenty hour uh, MacBook Air. I don't. I don't care what I'm going to buy in 2021 or 2022. I'm hoping for the for the Stonehenge style uh, Mac Pro that I'm saving up money for. But this yeah. solves so many problems in my life, uh, particularly coming from a 2015 MacBook Pro. It's like, yeah, wow. yeah. <laughs> it's like it's I like it's like walking into the light end. after being in a bunker for like two years. It's like, oh my god. Meanwhile, <laughs> as we continue, let me talk a little bit about this new TriCaster we're using here. Yes, it's time. John says, I've learned a new trick on the New Tech TriCaster 2 Elite. As you know, we started this podcast years ago as audio only, but very quickly, a lot of people said, you, we, I want to see what you're doing. And so we started, uh, we started, I, first I started with one of those Logitech ball cams and so forth, but it wasn't very long before we realized, yeah, maybe we should get some cameras, get a studio set up, get some lights, but what are we going to switch it with? And I did a lot of research and I came up with easily the best solution. Oh, my God, it's happening. <laughs> it's happening. Something's happening. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Nuka. Wow. Uh, if you're not watching the video. I wear the chains <laughs> I forged in life. I forged them link by link and yard by yard. Oh, Your chain it. was as thick and ponderous as this one seven Christmases ago. I don't you know what we're going to do with this, but it's a cool effect. Look at that. That's this is the TriCaster is is amazing. I mean, we we started years ago with the with the original TriCaster. We just got the brand new TriCaster 2 Elite, which is the top of the line. It's a, it is the most complete live production system on the planet. And given what it does, it's very affordable. You there's a full line of TriCasters at newtech.com/tricaster. newtech.com/tricaster. Uh, we'll show you a little video of some of the things you can do with the TriCaster 2 Elite. We're still learning. We had our, our I think, our first training, right, John, uh, yesterday. So we're starting to learn it. We use it. At, it's really more, we don't use it as fully as you can. It's really a live video production system. In fact, it's more than that. It, it's an all-encompassing digital media solution. It makes it gives you the capability of doing content for internet, mobile, TV. A lot of uh, sports channels, TV channels use a TriCaster, which explains why we have we have nine buttons on our new TriCaster for instant replay. I don't, I don't know if that's going to come up a lot on MacBreak Weekly, but if we needed to, we could do instant replay. And I'm using one of the things New Tech invented, NDI. Uh, all of the TriCaster stuff is software-driven IP-native technology which gives you the capability, the connectivity, and the control you need to take on any sort of digital media production. The, the video, for instance, you see from my MacBook Pro 13 uh, is actually not going through a scan converter, which was what we did for years, in fact, until today, is going through the network using the NDI interface. It's actually riding on our company Ethernet network. When you consider the, the variety of features offered, there is nothing... Nothing even close to the TriCaster 2 Elite. There's a live call connect. If you do calls as we do, you can enhance your production by letting by connecting to anyone, anywhere, on any device. High quality video and audio. Doesn't matter what your callers are using. Microsoft Skype, Teams, Zoom meetings, Slack, everything. Taps right into that. Built in. There's the live set technology, which we also don't use. We really should, which could transform any location into an elaborate virtual environment that you can move in front of, behind, and you get full access to the premium library of a New Tech Live 
set virtual sets. They have some amazing stuff. So there's also the live graphics creator. This was huge for us. All the graphics now you see on our shows are created in Photoshop, including animated titles, motion graphics, looping effects, imported directly from Adobe Creative Cloud tools into our production system. Live graphics creator, that's what it's called. And it really makes it easier and faster to do graphics than ever before. You don't have to be a, a flame expert, you know, specially trained. It, you can do it in Photoshop, tools you're already using. And, of course, streaming, which we use, you can stream to whatever you want, including convenient presets for Facebook Live, Microsoft Azure, Twitch, YouTube Live, and on and on and on. I just think it's the TriCaster 2 Elite is actually changing the world of video production for churches, for television networks, for sports, and, of course, for fancy podcasts like mine. It's transformative. It's better than broadcast. It's a TriCaster. Now, not every TriCaster is right for every uh, user. So you, I want you to go to newtech, N-E-W-T-E-K dot com slash TriCaster. There's a guide there that'll help you choose which TriCaster is right for you. Of course, I know our engineers. They immediately said, well, what's this one? The, the most expensive one, the TriCaster <laughs> 2 Elite. What's that one? And it is amazing. Show that effect again. Is that the effect you learned at the training, John, with the... This, the the various screens going in and out and moving around. That's wild. I don't know what we would use that for, but... Oh, look. No, uh, nothing, nothing oh, 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 oh. <laughs> we could get rid of these avatars. <laughs> we could totally... You know what, John? Put we should just... back in my frame. Oh. We could just get rid of these clunky old TVs and do that. You guys could be floating. How hard... Could we Virtual. just do that all the time? Can, can you, wait, can you are wait we really not my... on those monitors? Is that all a fake out? I have no idea anymore. I used to know how this <laughs> stuff works. As far as I know, I could be in my bedroom right now. This whole thing could be virtual. <laughs> they don't tell me. They don't. John, really, I'm serious. We could get rid of the avatars. I'm in the Phantom Zone. This is uh, Andy, uh, Andy and Atko. I mean, you're live and right from Network 23. I'm, I'm, I'm Max. <laughs> we thank New Tech. There's, you know, it's funny. Every once in a while, we'll get an engineer who goes, "Okay, I'm going to do." And we, they, Kevin King is like that. He just says, "I'm going to do something weird." Anthony's like that. I'm just going to do something. And weird things happen. Uh, they love plumbing the depths, and there, and it's really almost infinite. Tricaster Two Elite. Thank you, New Tech. NewTech.com slash Tricaster. Um, I want to use those instant replay buttons because then if, you know, if yeah. Andy and I get in an argument, I could say, well, Andy, earlier you said. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, well, also you know, because. Let's that, look at that, that in super slow-mo. <laughs> that, that's really good because, you know, I remember the last time we had an argument just like it was yesterday. <laughs> now it's possible, Leo. It's possible that they could ingest the last ten years of Mac break, and then you don't even have to come in anymore. Well, It'll just play the appropriate Leo response. That's my, what any of us said. That's my secret, you know, plan. Yeah, <laughs> just have a, a big keyboard with different Leo answers. An ML Leo. ML Leo. That's where that's where we're headed. Okay, we're gonna let Andy cry into his koala a little bit, and then we. Will... I'm fine. I'm strong. <laughs> I must be strong. Mac shipments rise. 49% in Q4, leading the industry. PC sales in general are doing really well, better than they've done in a, in a decade. Yeah. But I'm glad to see the Mac is part of all that. That's great. 49%, yeah. man. Well, 49% of nothing ain't a lot. But still, <laughs> it's a little, you know, that's a little deceptive to say, you know, a percentage. But, uh, but I think, no, it's good. And I think... I believe the, the M1 is going to help are probably that. better than the market share yes, numbers. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Apple's now the number four uh, PC uh, manufacturer worldwide based on fourth quarter 2020 shipments. Um, and and for the a good year, quarter, Leo. I can't wait for the results. It's going to be It's going to be really quarter. fun, yeah. That's, is that All soon? the iPhone is in the fourth quarter. Is that soon? Yeah. When, is that this week? Yeah, I believe it's soon. Oh, boy. All know, right. I don't think it's this week. We we'll get check. Jason Snell to fire up his uh, graph machine. Lenovo, <laughs> just in case you're interested, Lenovo's number January one. January 27th. The 27th, okay. Lenovo's number one, HP's number two, Dell's number three, Apple's number four, Acer is number five, both for the year and the quarter. But Apple had the most growth, 49.2% growth. I tell you, whoever writes a how-to book to go with all those oh, new maps. Oh, man, that would be a good idea. I can't believe up. you're you're still writing books, David. I know. Is that well, a good business? Said. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I you can't. know, 
it's a it's an experiment. I mean, yeah. it is true that computer books have basically gone away. I mean, this the bookstore shelves of computer books are really tiny now. Everybody gets their information from Google and YouTube, and that's that's fine. Uh, this is an experiment to see if there are still people who like structured, written by a professional writer, amply illustrated, indexed, you know, to have on your desk. Uh, a lot of people in my generation do. <laughs> I get calls all the time on the radio show. What's a good book? And I always recommend yours. I, re I recommended the Missing Manuals when uh, you were doing those. I will re recommend the Unlocked series now um, because of that. Uh, so there are, yeah, I think, and I've also always said, look, everybody learns in a different way. If you're if you're a visual learner, you might prefer YouTube. If you're auditory, you might listen to podcasts. But honestly, I think a lot of people, I, I'm one of them. Uh, I I like to see it on paper. I like to read it, and, uh, and I think it's a. Good I gotta say, when when we were researching Mac Unlocked and iPhone Unlocked, we looked at what's available on Amazon, and it's unbelievable how many of the book titles now say for seniors, iPhone 12 for seniors. I mean, they're they're just taking what you just said and making it a firm assumption that nobody's going to buy a book unless you're old. Right. I'm just. I'm just not sure I buy that. Surely yeah. there are people in other age brackets who like the form factor. When I'm, you know, when I'm learning programming languages, which I do all the time, I very often will order uh, a hard, a, a paperback, but a physical uh, version of the book because I like to have it open while I'm next to my computer. I mean, that makes sense. I think for some books, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. I wish you, I wish you luck, and I'm glad somebody's still writing computer books. <laughs> now, if you could only bring Computer Shopper back, I think we'd all be <laughs> so and CompuServe happy. and CompuServe. Yeah, uh, the num most downloaded game in December <clears throat> among us, <laughs> among us. So sus, so sus. Yeah, yeah. Shopper. Um, very popular. Um, forty-eight million downloads in December. Forty-eight million downloads in December. It that's, just took off. That's. Now, a lot of them now are through everybody Google Play, is streaming let's be it. fair. Four to one Google Play to Mac OS. Yeah, it's, it's big on Twitch, right? You watch Among Us, AOC. On YouTube, too. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There, there are a bunch of people who got to like million plus YouTube streaming accounts just doing Among Us just over the summer, like huge creators like Corpse and Valkyrie <laughs> and so many people. And they all have these Among Us thumbnails with... You know, 9,000 IQ on them and people just watched hours and hours of it. And then they were brilliant because they'd collaborate and you'd see like team ups. And apparently we just could not watch enough of it. Hey, we I, are so in the wrong business. I know. <laughs> Among us, probably you could do that in a weekend. It's not the most complicated or visually demanding of games. Right. I, I have uh, an iPhone 12. I have that case with a circle on it that Apple showed. I have that puck that goes... Onto it and stop MagSafe. the MagSafe. It doesn't charge anymore. It stopped wireless what? charging. Yeah, I oh, guess no. that could happen, right? I can't. It doesn't even on a, on, on my old cheat chargers. I'm a little disappointed. Leo, you're not holding it right. I must be. I must be. I finally said. Are you putting it screen side down, Leo? <laughs> oh, oh, you mean in the other? My my mom. I, okay, <laughs> she's not watching, but I'm going to tell you a little story on my mom. I gave her an Apple Watch. Uh, for Christmas because I thought, oh, she really, because she's just 88 and, uh, you know, the yeah. fall detection and just, you know, keeping track of her and all that. And um, she was charging it. I think I, if I told this before, I don't want to hurt her feelings. She was charging it, but she thought that the round part was the face of the watch. <clears throat> so she was charging it <laughs> on, on the screen and it would never charge. And I said, well, what are you, she says, it's not charging. So, well, show me what you're doing. And she, this was faced up, the round part. And I said, oh, mom, you put the charger on that side. And it fixed it. So maybe it's me. Maybe I just, it's a Laporte problem. <laughs> I'll have to try it with the other side up. Runs in the family. Yeah. No, I was just wondering if anybody had that uh, problem or heard about that. It, you know, is a coil in here. It could have become dislodged somehow or, uh, you know, failed. It worked at first, but it doesn't anymore, which is fine. I, I have the same setup, Leo. I have not, I have not seen that. Okay. Yeah, I like the puck. I like the magazine. Oh, I love it. I didn't, but now because of that, I've been able to get a wallet case because these things are too thick to charge wirelessly. So since I went back to lightning charging, now I can have a wallet. What are you going to do with again. the portless iPhone, Leo? That's it for you. <sighs> Done. Dead. Deep. Then it Dead. would be bad. That would be bad. Yeah. Now, uh, another thing you can't do 
if you want to do wireless charging, is a pop socket. <laughs> Does anybody use a pop socket? They have. Uh, I see a lot of pop sockets out there. Uh, yeah, younger folks. It's the young. It's the youngins, right? Um, in fact, my my son who went to CU Boulder, Henry says it was invented by somebody at CU Boulder, and he's a billionaire now. Yeah. Oh. Um, so Pop Socket has announced a new MagSafe compatible. They call it a Pop Grip. They're not all marble. Don't get the marble one. That's disgusting. But <laughs> apparently, it it isn't adhered adhered to the iPhone as the old ones were with glue. It's magnetic, so it goes. And then you take it off, and you can put your puck on it. So, I like that. It. Seems like a good use of the MagSafe connector. The other one that seems like a good use is I saw there's a tripod. You just slap your phone on this thing, oh, and the magnet. Oh, I'll have to check that out. Because nice. I have I have this thing. Those of you who are watching on. Yeah, I online. use that. Yeah, it's a it's a. But, but yeah. it presses the volume keys. You know, if you don't right. position it. I know. Right, yeah, I know. You have to you have to put it on <laughs> off center to make it. I not keep press turning the my phone. He, David, for those of you only listening, many of us have this. It's an expandable adapter for a smartphone, so it could fit any size. So it's like, but it has two fingers on either side and a, and a spring, and then you put that on a tripod. And I use exactly that, David. And, I, and invariably, I'll switch the fight. It'll say slide to turn off. I say, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so the MagSafe tripod, that makes a lot of sense. That's a good the idea. One, the one I have heard that isn't so successful are are the wallets that mag magnet mm. onto the back. Because like you slide it into your pocket, it you slide right it off. right off. Yeah. Don't put your money in that. The, it's Moment, the folks who make those add-on uh, lenses for iPhones, they are making a tripod yeah. mount. That oh, is, that's cool. Yeah, it's just a that goes right on the back. They have I a good on anamorphic lens as well. Do they? Explain, yeah. tell me what anamorphic is, because I see that all the time and I feel like an idiot. I mean, I'm not Alex Lindsay, so I can't give you an accurate that's why, explanation. That's why I don't know, because Alex has explained it to me a hundred times and I still don't understand it. Yeah, it, I believe it, it's from it's from the oldie time days when they had to figure out a way to get wider pictures using the same amount of data. And so I, I, I am not good at explaining this, but it basically uh, it, it's basically shot in a normal aspect ratio, but has data that then gets it compressed down oh. to a wide angle aspect ratio that contains all that data. And it does strange things to the bokeh and to the lights. So that's why people like it. Like when you watch Star Trek, it has all those really extended lens flares because of the way it compresses all, all the data when recording the image. And I'm going to get so many angry film students writing to me. I think that's pretty yeah. accurate. So you're shooting in 4.3, in but it's distorted yes. so that when you process it, you then expand it to the, the widescreen. Th that's exactly what it is in film, right? You use the 4.3 yeah. film, but you're getting a widescreen image up, upon playback because it gets redistorted on playback. But I'm not sure... What, yeah, what would, would it mean in a digital? In a digital, yeah, yeah. Anamorphic. Maybe it just gives you those uh, effects that people like. The lenses are expensive because I've been looking at anamorphic lenses lately, okay. and they're all like PL mount and like thousands and thousands of dollars. Do you want to shoot your 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 show in anamorphic? I want to look like the bridge of the Enterprise, Leo. <laughs> I want Cinerama. Just let just let just make everybody have to download it and then go into a big dome. Two point five nine <laughs> to one. I remember going to my first Cinerama movie when I was a kid. My grandma brought me to a movie called Circus World, and it was wild because it I'd never seen the screens curved and it went around you almost, and we were all in awe. But my chiefly my memory of that is eating too many malted milk balls and getting sick. But that's <laughs> that's another that's another story for another time. We're learning all kinds of things. About you. <laughs> uh, where where were we? <laughs> oh Lord! Um, that, that, there was also a problem like that in Tadeo with people getting sick, nauseous, too much yes. candy, watching. Yeah, that, nauseated. You know? that's, yeah, that's why you yeah. don't see people use shooting in that form. Anymore. No, no, thank goodness. Yep. Mm -hmm. And also while watching Wonder Woman 1984, same problem. I got sick and I didn't even, you know, I only saw the second half. It wasn't good, sick. but it could have been worse. <laughs> Did you see that's it? Did you joke. finally it see it? It made people sick. Yeah. It was so I paid bad. the 30 bucks for it because you had to pay oh, for it in Canada. Canada. Because oh. Canada, oh. It was only streaming so, in the U.S. Everywhere else had to. You have like universal health care. Stop complaining. Gee. How is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, Renee, uh, have you had any problem with condensation in your AirPod Max ear cups? 
No, I uh, I haven't, and I have worn them for long periods of time indoors. And the the working theory is that the the alu the aluminium cups are cold, and your ears are warm. <laughs> and when those two meet in the middle, it creates condensation. Oh. Uh, but I've been trying, and either I'm too cold, <laughs> you know, as a human, I'm just too cold. <laughs> but I haven't I haven't been able to see it. Although I know people who have, or some people just have sweaty ears. It's not sweat, and I, I'm not going to taste test it, but I believe other people have, and it's it's not <laughs> sweat, it's, not it's condensation. Salty. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, little note, 9 to 5 Mac, one of their uh, readers, Damien Men, uh, sent his AirPod Max back for warranty, and they say, take the ear cups off before you ship it back to us. <coughs> oh, interesting. Hmm. They don't want your Jeremy ear cups. You think it's that? Maybe it's that. Yeah, I think it's also maybe they don't maybe want to lose them. Lost. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it makes sense, especially for a company who's trying to cut down on plastic and stuff. Sure. Why? Why send those in for repair? Mm. Yeah, and I also presume that if you have a problem people. with your ear cups, you can get them replaced. I would guess. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Andy. Go ahead. No, I'm saying also. Also, it's a consumable. So, I mean, they're not going to replace a consumable. They may as well, for all the reasons uh, that were stated before, but also the fact that this is not part of the, this is yours. You have to keep that. That's yours permanently. We don't want to ever touch them again. Yep. Um, do not do this <laughs> with your Apple Watch and your camera. Mitchell Clark says you can use your Apple Watch as a viewfinder. <laughs> <laughs> on yeah. your camera. Just I saw people posting that all last week. Yeah, just don't do that, okay? It's, you know, that's as bad well, as... Well, I mean, a lot of people use, like, some people can't afford a camera and they get started making videos, whether it's TikTok or YouTube or something, and they'll use the front-facing camera, but the back ones are really good. They're much better. Really better quality. Yeah. yeah. So they use this yeah. as a hack to to center <clears> themselves <throat> and figure out how to record themselves for videos. I, I can see that, but why not leave it on your wrist? Why do you, why strap it onto the phone? Because then you're looking down. This way you're looking at it. So your eyes, your yeah. eye line is with the audience when you're recording the well, video. I know, but video. you just check framing. You can just, you know. I shouldn't poo-poo it. People are on the Twitter saying it's the best hack ever. <laughs> so, it's the best hack since custom icons. Why doesn't the watch uh, go to sleep, though? I mean, around our lock. I, can you, can, the photo app doesn't. It gives you some time when uh, you're in the photo app because okay. it, it knows you're in a live view. And if it goes to sleep, it's bad for the, your photo taking. Okay. Yeah, this, this, but this, this gives me an excuse to to say it once again that I think that one line of accessories that I don't think Apple has really prosecuted as well as they should have is the idea of using the Apple Watch sort of more as a pocket watch, as this little key, little square poster stamp of incredible technology that you could snap onto a console someplace else, or snap in this case on the back of a of, of a phone case for a second monitor. Uh, there's there, there, there are times where I kind of want that functionality, but I still want to have like my my regular Casio G-Shock on my wrist. He says, pointing toward a wrist that does has no Casio G-Shock on it. Uh, it it's it's a sort of it's a sort of thing that if it were thirty or forty dollars and were available in a variety of attractive colors, I would probably wind up owning one or two of them. Uh, if it meant that I could just simply have this in the watch pocket of my jeans and then consult it for uh, uh, consult it occasionally for 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 dapper effect. It's funny you should say that because remember the iPod Nano? It was basically yes. the size and shape of the iP of the watch but without the band. And I remember there was this whole aftermarket right. of people selling wristbands right. to put yep. your iPod Nano to use that as a watch. Right. Yep. All right, I'm going to try it, it now. So I, the other I, thing, I, it, it won't hassle you about not being physically fit either. It will just say, <laughs> okay, guess Much what? better. Much better. Keep listening to music. Watch more you, movies. So, you, could, you, could be, you could be having a heart attack. We don't care. We don't know. <laughs> don't it's care. really none of our business. You don't have to stand up, okay? You don't have to. <laughs> and breathing, optional. So <laughs> uh, I, I'm on my watch. I'm selecting camera remote. And uh, no items today. No, I must have pushed the wrong button. <laughs> I'm going to press <laughs> camera. I said I'm going to replace camera remote. Okay, and I've got my, my phone is in. It's not working. Let me tell you, this makes some great podcast. It's good. Radio. It's good podcast. Yes. Anyway, go ahead. Try it at home. Great radio. Great we're, cre radio. we're creating a, We're creating a theater of the air, just like the old Mercury Theater of the <laughs> RCA days. But we can't see anything either. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Don't um, break the illusion, David. Come on. <laughs> Let's face for radio and a voice for text. <laughs> I want to take a little break here. 
Um, and I'm, I'm announcing it because, and I apologize, apparently. In, so we, have, we started using a service called Megaphone uh, last year, uh, which inserts ads... Uh, direct, it's called direct ad insertion. And in theory, the way it's supposed to work is I'm supposed to say, and now we're going to talk about something else, pause for a beat, and then we talk about something else. And our editors put an inaudible tone in there. And then when you download it, uh, you download it from Megaphone servers and Megaphone sticks an ad right there and it should be seamless. It should feel like a natural... But I've been getting emails from people, and I apologize if this has happened to you, who are saying in the middle of Andy's sentence, I mean, we all get a little impatient with Andy, but apparently Megaphone really is impatient with you. In the middle of Andy's sentence. And now you oh, I finally know. Thank you very much. <laughs> they have put an ad, and then the ad plays, and then Andy goes on. Don't cry into your koala. It's okay. We love you, Andy. But I'm just saying I apologize to people. So uh, we're going to see if this works. We'll have more with David Pogue, Andy Inako, and Renee Ritchie in just a bit. And now we're back. I don't know. We'll see if it works. We, it's not turning are you, out. Are you, are you saying like film strip technology? I don't, yeah, exactly. Press the clicker. Press the clicker. Beep. Tim Cook. Next slide, to have please. have an announcement tomorrow. I don't <laughs> so, Supplies of M1 chips. Leo, I've got a question about your ad protocol. So yes. when you do the in-person ads, I'm, I'm launching my own podcast uh, in February. I'm the last person in America. Perfect timing, it. David. This is yeah, exactly. a great time to launch a new podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, but so when you read those ads, I've, I've noticed that Almost always, they are in fact really great products. Well, I mean, they're yeah. They're we're good. very careful. We don't pick stuff that. Uh, well, yeah. that's what I was going to say. Have you ever been approached by somebody whose stuff really isn't good? Oh, every day. Really? Turn, oh, yeah. We turn down a lot. In fact, I remember you turn them down all the time. I was at an upfront a few years ago talking to advertisers. The upfronts are where you, at the end of the year, sell ads for the new year. And I said that. I said, oh, yeah, we say no to a lot of advertisers. And there was an audible gasp from the audience. <laughs> You're getting one said, from me, too. You turned down. Yeah, because I don't want to do, uh, no, none of us can do an ad for something that we go, this thing stinks, but I'm going to do an ad for it. That would that would be no fun. So, Dude, a lot of people do that. Oh, Most yeah. People do oh, that. Pretty much everybody does. <laughs> yeah. I'm the I don't same know. way as you, Leo. Yeah, it's I, called money. Well, and as a matter of fact, it's been a very tough year because of COVID. Uh, that's why I'm mocking you for starting a podcast. Um, <laughs> the, the, a lot of, even on the radio show, advertising dollars are, are drying up. Uh, I suspect what's going to happen, and if you can hang on, I think you'll be fine, David, is that people are just so nervous about COVID, the economy, about the transition. There's just so much as making advertisers' stomachs go flip-flop. Uh, that they're just holding back, and podcasts are the easiest thing not to buy, you know. Uh, but but as we were saying, I still see a lot of public service announcements on network television. I mean, they're not selling out. I'm sure of it. So, uh, but I suspect what will happen is the vaccine kicks in, as life settles down, we get a little bit more normal. Um, there will be all of this pent up demand that these there'll be billions of dollars that have been held back that will uh. suddenly flow into the economy. And I think that's going to probably be in the fourth quarter. So if you can... Turn your wow. umbrellas upside down. Yeah, exactly. It's pennies from heaven, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, mercifully, my podcast is being done by PRX and Simon & Schuster. So oh, you don't have to selling worry. Selling ads, not my problem. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. That's the way to do it, by the way. Uh, yeah. No, I, I think that it's... Um, honestly, uh, you know, it, it's probably not the best time to start a podcast, partly because... Unless it's a news podcast, people are so, for the last year, have been so consumed by news that shows like uh, the New York Times, The Daily, NPR's Up First, they're doing very well uh, because people are like obsessed by the news. But it's hurt, uh, I think, podcasts like ours that are really a little bit more, you could, you could take it or leave it. <laughs> Wow. If I got an extra hour, man. Show two. title. The show, you can, you know, nobody's making you listen. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad. What's your show going to be about? Uh, it's called Unsung Science. Perfect. David Pogue. And each one will tell, start to finish the story of a successful science project that 
through all the odds, through all the difficulties, made it out the other end. So the first episode is about, do you know about debug Fresno? This is the coolest damn thing. With, with climate change, mosquitoes are going north in the United States and bringing with them all kinds of disease. So Google's sister company, Verily, decided they were going to do this radical experiment in Fresno where they would blast out 20 million per summer male mosquitoes <laughs> who had all been sterilized. What? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and they mate with the females. They have sex. Neither and nothing party. happens, but a lot well, of Well, no, they have eggs that never hatch. Oh, wow. And in one summer, they decreased the mosquito population of Fresno, California by 95%. What's weird is and nobody wants to live there still. But uh, that's another problem. <laughs> David, does, 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 the, does the episode cover what like, the mosquito Matthew pope Panzerino. has to say about procreation <laughs> without uh, procreation? <laughs> I think and there's no genetic in, in, engineering involved. There's wow. no spraying involved. How do you sterilize a mosquito? Is it a very complicated procedure? <laughs> no, <laughs> actually, <laughs> so they, they, they infected the ah. male mosquitoes with a very common ah. bacteria called Wolbachia that's already in half the mosquito species. So, and then it's all, it's not really sterilization, it's incompatibility. Oh. So the males and the females of the wild, the, the, the lab males, the wild females mate and they're incompatible. So their eggs never hatch. Is, uh, is Wolbachia available at my local CVS? <laughs> Uh, anyway, what, what's going to be the name of the podcast? It's called Unsung Science. And it will be out next month? Uh, at the end of February. That's awesome. Congratulations. Great uh, great luck yeah, with that. Well, I'll yeah. be pinging you up PRX, for advice. You can come. Yeah, well, you don't need my advice. But PRX is great. You're going to do great. That's a great uh, yeah. business. Um, David Pogue is our very special guest. I am thrilled to see you, David. I, I just love having yeah. you on. Uh, you are so kind. So. Yeah, and of course you're way too big for us with CBS Sunday Morning and, <laughs> and you know Nova and all the stuff that you do, the new books. But uh, anytime you want to come by, uh, we just love having you here. Did you have it's a pick so of the week? Fun. I did have a pick of the week, actually. Um, believe it or not, uh, I am I've been a Fitbit guy forever. Just got an Apple Watch for Christmas for my wife. Thank you, Nikki. And um, the one thing that does badly is sleep tracking. It doesn't show you your cycles, like your REM cycles and your dream cycles. So my wife, Nikki, said, surely there's some app that takes the Apple Watch's data and does a better job of parsing it. And she did. There is such a thing. It's called Sleep Watch. I have ah, nothing to do with it. Okay. But um, the, the, the graphics are fantastic. It, uh, sorry, it's not focusing. Um, I have it here, fact, though. It's okay. I have it on the... I'm sorry for this. anyone who's watching your podcast. I'm sorry for the whole day of <laughs> my new... We apologize for everything. Hunting. Look at this uh, Apple it. Watch interface. Holy yeah, cow. Yeah, so it shows you a graph of your cycles. Show them how much actual rest you got. It shows you how many times you woke up in the night. Um and it shows you something really important, which is how consistent your bedtime is. Mm. It turns out that's more important to how rested you feel mm -hmm. than how many hours you slept. Mm. It's how consistent is the period that you're sleeping. So anyway, so love screwed. this thing. It's free. <laughs> <laughs> Andy goes to bed at 2 a.m. at 5 p.m. It doesn't all, you know. I, 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 try, I try to go to bed at least once a day. I'm not always <laughs> religious about that, but... <laughs> And, and one more thing, if you if you do decide to pay their fee, um, they do something that all these wearables have never been good at, which is it tries to draw conclusions from your data. So, for example, on this app Sleepwatch, you say what happened to you last night. Uh, there was a pet in the room. Uh, it was right. bright. I was right. wearing earplugs, whatever. I went for exercise. It's not my fault, I, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, then the next, and then over time, it says we've noticed – that when you have a glass of wine with dinner, uh -huh. you sleep worse mm -hmm. or whatever. It makes mm -hmm. conclusions based on you. Just what I need, a little judgment. Does it give <laughs> you a single number sleep score? It does indeed, yep. Yeah. My wife- I got is, a 645 last night. Oh, mine's only on zero to 100 and I got a 56. So <laughs> that's not so good. <laughs> And what are you using? What's your what's I your use uh, something from um, Beautyrest that goes, it's a little pad that goes under the- in between the mattress and the box spring. So I don't even have to think about it. I don't want to, I don't like wearing my watch to bed. That's really the main reason for that. But 56, my, and my wife, Lisa, is very competitive. So she'll wake up and say, I got an 89, what'd you get? And she <laughs> yeah. knows. I got a, I got a 62. 
<laughs> Nikki knows. and I do the same thing. Do you? Yeah. What'd yeah. you get? So what'd you get, David? What'd you get? What'd you get? She it's got not, a 522. Oh, jeez. It's not <laughs> like you're in control of it. It's not like you can work harder and to sleep better. So, so is can I ask you a question? Is this app uh, sophisticated enough to sense when your partner is sabotaging your sleep score? <laughs> you should make that. That's in the premium version. Nikki woke me up every twenty minutes. It's not my fault. Sleep Watch by Body Matter. I will have to try this. Uh, it's yeah, an it's really Apple nice. Watch. Although you can enter it manually if you don't have an Apple Watch, but really, this only makes sense if you've got an Apple Watch. What I like is how much of the information you get on the watch. Yes. Uh, that's really Agreed. interesting. Like, like yeah. all of it. You just yeah. scroll through it. Yeah. yeah. Wow. What's that sound? Is that your koala, that, Andy? No, that's that's Wilbur trying to get up. Oh, Wilbur. Hey, Wilbur. I haven't seen you in a while. Wilbur. Kitty. Wilbur. Did you name him after Mr. Ed's owner? No, no. Wilbur and Otis. He and his twin uh, brother. Wilbur. Otis. <laughs> Andy and Akko, pick of the week. Um, my pick of the week is my favorite TV show on Netflix of all time, which of course changes uh, every every couple of months. Uh, it's uh, it's called Pretend It's a City. It's a I don't know what's I don't know what you call it. It's it's Fran Lebowitz. Oh, I love telling her. in New York City, telling stories and talking. But she's talking to her friend Martin Scorsese, who is who. It's the perfect situation because he clearly just loves having conversations with Fran Lebowitz, and so he, sometimes you hear him like Martin. Scorsese laughing, but he's also directing it very, very well. And it's just <clears> every, <throat> I, I, it was one of those horrible situations where speaking of sleep, where it's like, uh, my, my Google TV with the, uh, my Google Chromecast with Google TV, whatever you're supposed to call it was recommending it. It's, oh, that's right. I, I, I want to at least like add it to my favorites list so that when it's not 1am and I actually have time to, I should not be going to bed. I can just, and then I wound up watching the first five minutes and then it's like, Oh, five 30. Isn't that interesting, Andy? Uh, but yeah, it's uh, I, I can't recommend it highly enough, possibly because it's so well timed for the situation that we're all in where like I'm not I haven't traveled more than a couple of, of uh, a couple of miles from my house since uh, March. I miss going to New York uh, and hanging out there. And this is like lots of shots like inside New York. Uh, and also you kind of miss like face to face socialization with people you don't see from time to time. So seeing these two friends just getting together like in a bar, like at a table in a restaurant and just talking is just just a really wonderful thing to eavesdrop on. So oh. highest, highest recommendation. And you don't feel dirty afterwards as you do with a lot of like popular Netflix series. Yeah. So. Yeah. Guilt like Tiger King. Yeah. Guilty watches. Yeah. I did not, I did not want to invoke the name of the beast. Let's just not yes. say it two more times. Lest, lest it appear. I love <laughs> New York. I mean, I, I actively love New York. And so I think it would be, I can't wait to watch this. It'd be, it'd be great. I can't wait to see it. Thank you for that suggestion. Fran Lebowitz, Martin Scorsese, it's a series called Pretend It's a City. And there are, don't get your hopes up, there are only seven episodes, but still, still. Can't. This is perfect uh, COVID watching because it's not a big production thing, right? That's safe, they can yeah. do it. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. No, there was a, I'll just say like the thing that got me hooked for like two hours was the, the first I think the first real scene is like uh, she and Scorsese are doing a QA and a with an audience and when the audience questions is does it annoy you when and then Fran says yes <laughs> <laughs> that's Fran Leibowitz <laughs> in a nutshell yes it all annoys me Renee Ritchie pick of the week Okay, so these are, I don't know if Alex maybe has picked these in the past, but they're new to me. And these are Aperture's M, M12, I think, MC, no, sorry, MC lights. And they look small. They're inductively charged, so you can just put them on a oh. charging pad to charge them. They're battery operated. Oh. You can mount them on a standard tripod head if you really want to. But the cool thing is you turn them on and then you can, they're at zero when you start them off. And then you can just whoop, start oh. turning them up oh boy. and they get oh, very that's bright. Wow. And what's even better is they are red, green, blue lights. So you can hold them down and go into where's the hue. And then you can oh, start changing the Pipel. hue Pipel. on Pipel. the lights. It's orange. It's green. And they're also magnetic so that if you have something metal nearby, you can just slap oh, them I gotta on get these. whatever the surface is. That's brilliant. And 
I bought the case. So you can get a case of 12 of them. The case charges <laughs> them inductively <laughs> and has accessories for you to charge. Like they have the, 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 the mini, U, the, sorry, the mini USB if you want to charge them that way. So USB, I think it's USB-C now on these. Uh, and all a bunch of different accessories, a diffuser light, but they are great if you're doing any sort of like, especially if it's dark, but if you're doing any sort of uh, product photography or you just need a light source, like you want to just put this off to you the side, 12 of give them? you like a little bit of, what do you need 12 for? I'm, Leo, I have plans. I have plans <laughs> and machinations, but just the case was so brilliant because well, you can also I, buy I, I them in a four, in in a four case, by the yes. way, you don't have to buy 12 of them. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> and I'm sure Alex bought them in 108 case. Yeah, you know, if they sell one of those, they're out of but stock. They're so I'm handy. sorry I have a to bunch say. Of them. Oh, I wish they were. What's out the of price stock. on those? Oh my gosh. $14.99 for 12. $4.99 for yeah. four. Yeah, you can get much bucks. Wow. 90 bucks for a single one. But you gotta yeah, get the case. Every you gotta get the case because it charges in the case. So that's brilliant. Well, you can charge them differently. Like you can charge them by themselves too with a little cable. Yeah. But almost every, I, I got them because almost every photographer I knew had them in their gear bag because there's always some situation where you just, right. you don't have the light or you need right. an accent and you can pull this out. You can put them on anything and they give you just that little, that little bit of extra light that you need in almost any situation. Uh, and I've been super, super happy with them. They just made, I, I usually at night I would get horrible, not horrible, but I would get really noisy photographs. Mm -hmm. Now I just put a few of them up mm -hmm. and it looks great. I love yeah. the magnets. I, 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 I can't recommend this or the, these sort of pocket lights uh, strongly enough. It is part of my standard travel gear, partly because even when you're just taking like goofy selfies of yourself uh, someplace, you know, the, the, the difference between like how come like instead of, instead of the, the, the phone going for the low light mode where it looks like garbage or instead of having to deal with the fact that you've got shadows on your face, you because you actually want to get a picture of yourself at that museum exhibit with uh, Guillermo del Toro's, del Toro's uh, uh, horror collection. But you want a good picture of yourself and just having this like in your hand while you're taking the selfie works so great. And, and as uh, but also when I'm traveling, there's so many times where like. Like I, I might be at a friend's house and he doesn't have a desk lamp or he doesn't have a task lamp where I needed to go. But OK, that's OK. I ha I happen to have a task lamp with me. And and also when, I, when I'm using it as a flashlight, I feel like uh, I feel like uh, uh, I, I feel like uh, one of the uh, officers in Star Trek, the next, the next generation, those really cool like palm type uh, flashlights they used to use. Uh, it's, it's it is one of those things where if you buy a good one, you can buy cheap ones for like 20, 30 bucks, but buy a good one with a metal housing and. You will have it in yeah. your pocket. You will have it in your laptop bag, and there will be, and maybe you'll forget about it. But then there will be a time where the lights go out on uh, on your commuter train, and so or the it's working fine, but like the the light that you're at is is not working. So okay, well that's fine. I'll take this out, and this will be my task lamp for this thing. It, it so makes you feel like a grown adult who's in charge of every situation when you have this handy. Very nice. Another. Another does this, oh, well, Bernie, does, does this do like the, the really cool video effects that lighting effects that Aperture sometimes yes. has on their other lights? It yeah. has the effects mode cool. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you can make so, it look like a police a light is off in the distance or oh, flashing lights. Oh, or, I like yeah. that. So the only thing I don't like is the way they spell Aperture, which is yeah. Aperture, A-P-U-T-U-R-E. I'm sure it's for trademark reasons. Yeah. Apple. And the great thing about them too is like they've been making really premium lights lately. Like they made a, a 100, a 120D. I, I'm using the 300D right now. Then they made like a 600D, which I think, I think melted, actually melted a few people. <laughs> um, but now they've introduced a line of much less expensive ones that don't have the same kind of metal housing that aren't meant to be transportable, but they're starting to fill it in with a much more affordable line of lights and they're really good quality. I'm going to mention a couple of things. Uh, one is just, you know, self-serving because we I'm using the laptop here. I want to have something in the studio that I could just plug into. Pluggable just announced their new 7-in-1 USB-C uh, adapter. It has Ethernet. It has HDMI. It has uh, two USB 3 ports, one 4K HDMI, one gigabit Ethernet port, one SD card reader, one micro SD card reader, uh, and a USB-C power to the recharging port. And I'm just going to leave it here. And the best thing is, and actually it's a little more expensive when I bought it because uh, there was a $4 coupon, but it's 35 bucks. So a nice little dongle. If you've got one of the new uh, MacBooks, you're going to need a dongle. This looks like a good one. I've used pluggable stuff before, so this looks pretty good. And then this it's one's from. You on pardon me. That's that's got my name on it. Since so yeah. I'm about to get those M ones without enough jacks. Exactly. Yeah. One 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 plug does it all. Yeah. And then this is from the chat room, and uh, they mentioned it. And I'm 
I can't wait to watch it. NHK, which is, the, of course, the Japanese uh, uh, broad, public broadcaster, has a new documentary which came out on January 2nd uh, in honor of the 11th anniversary of Steve Jobs' passing, The Secret Passion of Steve Jobs. It's free. You can stream it on the Internet, and it looks really good. Somebody in the chat room recommended it, said they just loved it. So it's something you can watch uh, on your computer uh, from NHK World, The Secret Passion of Steve Jobs. And by the way, it begins with <laughs> the iPhone announcement. So it's timely, too. A couple of great recommendations for you. Just, uh, I, I don't, I, the URL is long. I think if you search for NHK and Secret Passion of Steve Jobs, you should be able to find it. David Pogue, thank you so much for being here. Plug your books again. <clears throat> Does Wilbur have uh, anything to plug? <laughs> Wilbur gets a cut of every sale. Oh, good, good, good. Yes, three new books. I had a busy pandemic. Mac Unlocked, <laughs> the perfect book for people getting their first Mac iPhone Unlocked covers all the iPhone 12s and iOS 14. Full color, ebook available now and the printed version in two weeks. And How to Prepare for Climate Change comes out on January 26th. It's where to live, how to invest, how to insure, how to talk to your kids, stuff like that. So uh, January uh, 26th, when I come in here and do the show, if I'm depressed, it's not because of the Apple earnings call. <laughs> it's because I've been reading his book. On the other hand, if I'm happy... Again, it's not because of the Apple's earning call, but because I've been reading David Pogue's book. You are you awesome. Go. Thank you so much Thank for you, uh, joining us. Do you? Somebody said you give up your pass, your your iPhone passcode in iPhone Unlocked. Maybe that's a play on the name. No, no. I I doctor them all in, in Photoshop. <laughs> okay, smart man. Uh, Andy Anaka, when are you going to be on GBH next? Uh, back to Fridays, uh, Friday th at uh, twelve thirty. Uh, just uh, go to wgbhnews.org and you can stream it live or later. Nice. And notco.com, I-H-N-A-T-K-O.com. And Renee Ritchie has, uh, of course, his eponymous show at youtube.com slash <laughs> Renee Ritchie, but also a new one with our good friend, Georgia Dow. Uh, it's called Apple Talk, also on YouTube. Anything else new? Anything else you want to plug? No, I'm just, it's, I feel like it's the quiet before the storm. We had, they were releasing products, including the AirPods Max, up until December. And there is no telling when they're going to start again <laughs> because you don't have to have physical events anymore. Right, right. So it could be like those press releases start dropping any time. So I'm just I'm trying, to, I'm trying to keep things going during the lull, but also set myself up for <laughs> on continued success in 2021. Well, we'll, we'll watch with great interest uh, CBS this morning I did tomorrow. Do, um, and see what's happening. I did yes. do a collaboration today with Devin Stone, Legal Eagle, um, about what all these words that people are throwing around in regards to Apple, Google, Amazon, Twitter, Facebook, what they actually mean legally in the U.S. because it's not not always the same as a colloquial definition. Oh, is that the parlor is versus amazing. Apple and Twitter piece? Yes. Real lawyer yes, with Devin reacts. Stone Esquire. Yes, yeah. a real lawyer reacts. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's really good. Like he he started off doing a lot of video reactions to like movies uh, and things like that. But this last month, he's just been explaining everything that's going on in terms of what the actual law says. And it's also fascinating to see how people read into that depending on their own point of view. <laughs> yeah, no, that'll be fascinating. Legal Eagle and Renee Ritchie. Yeah. And it's on Renee's YouTube channel. Thank you, all three of you, all four of you. Thank you, Wilbur, as well. <laughs> uh, great to have you. What a fun show. And yeah, we'll, next week we'll talk about getting vaccinated at an Apple store or something. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what it'll be. We'll find out tomorrow or morning. Or the car. Announce or the car. a car. Or a car. Could be a car. We don't know. <laughs> With Burt Reynolds. Uh, <laughs> Just a car. We do a Mac Break Weekly every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you want to see us do the show, it's just really a behind-the-scenes feed of us making the show. Uh, we stream that audio and video at YouTube.com. I'm sorry, at twit.tv slash live. It's YouTube, but there's also Ustream and Twitch and some other places you can watch or listen. But it's all at, at twit.tv slash live. Uh, if you're doing that, join us in the chat room, irc.twit.tv. That's our Twit community chat room. Lots of nice people. Uh, and they're all watching live at the same time. You can also join us in the Twit forums. If you, uh, if you listen on demand... The Twit community forums are at www.twit.community. They're great, very active. Uh, I want to kind of re-announce something I've been doing for some time, but I, 
uh, we're kind of off Twitter, and so I want to remind people that we also have a, a Mastodon instance. If you're on Mastodon at, you know, mastodon.social or gnu.social or somewhere else, you can follow uh, us at leo uh, at twit.social. But if you're not yet on Mastodon, go to twit.social and, and you can sign up. And we love having you uh, on that feed. It's a federated Twitter, so I like it a little bit better. Um, that's kind of my new home. If you uh, want to hear on-demand versions of the show, many places you can go. Our website's the first place to start, twit.tv slash mbw. There's also a version on YouTube. There's a Mac Break Weekly channel on YouTube. You can see all the shows there. You can also uh, subscribe. In fact, that's the easiest thing to do on your favorite podcast application. Just search for Mac Break Weekly. We've been there for a long time. You can do me a little favor. If you go to the website, we are doing our survey we do this at the beginning of every year to get to know you a little bit better. It gives us some ideas about how to shape our programming to fit your interests, but also helps us with advertisers because we don't like to gather information on you. So this way you can volunteer it only if you want to. Twit.tv slash survey 21. Answer whatever questions you're comfortable with. Don't, you don't have to answer them all. Twit.tv slash survey 21. Shouldn't take you more than five, ten minutes to uh, do, but it really helps us a lot. So thank you in advance. Uh, that's it for this edition of Mac Break Weekly. We'll see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye. <laughs> we do appreciate you watching this show right here on the Twit Network. If you want to make sure you are up to date on all things iOS, tvOS, watchOS, HomePod OS, all the OSs from Apple, you've got to check out iOS today. Rosemary Orchard, the incredible Rosemary Orchard, and myself talk each week about the news for iOS, the best apps and games, and so much more. You've got to check out the show. And we do appreciate you for subscribing. Subscribing.